My name is Nancy Fisher. Today's date is March 19th, 1998. I am here to interview the survivor, Leon Jolson, first name Jolson, in his home in New York City, USA, and the language of this interview is English. My name is Nancy Fisher. Today's date is March 19th, 1998. I'm here with the survivor, Leon Jolson, birth name Jolson, in his home in New York City, USA. The language of this interview is English. Please tell me, what is your name? My name is Leon Jolson. What was your name at birth? My name at birth was Josuzan. Can you spell that for me? Yes. J-O-L-S-O-H-O-N. Where were you born? I was born and I, I lived in Poland all my life, except when I made business trip or vacation trip. Do you know where you were born? Yeah, this is a small town. I would rather this is not uh, interesting for this interview. Where did you spend most of your life? Warsaw. Since I was a little baby, but I don't remember the time. What is your date of birth? The 9th of May, 1913. What is your age today? 84. What was your mother's name? My mother's name was Marble, and her first name was Blima. Blima is in uh, Jewish flower. What was your mother's maiden name? Marble. What was your father's name? My father's name is Shachnel. S-C-H-A-N-E-L. Did you have a Hebrew name? I have a Hebrew name and I have a Yiddish name. My Hebrew name is Dovit Yehuda. My Yiddish name is Label. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I did. Would you please tell me their names, starting with the oldest to the youngest? My older sister was Esther, and the second sister was Zipporah, then was Abraham, then was Sarah, then was Benjamin and Eichelman. What part of Warsaw did you live in? I, Warsaw had a, a, a million people, a million hundred. In Warsaw, you had 400,000 Jews, 385 between this and this. The 400,000 Jews lived in the northern side of the city and we had all kinds of institutions and neighborhoods. We had good neighborhoods in, in the place where the Jewish people have been uh, congregated and have been lower neighborhoods. And the same thing was in the other part where mostly the Gentile people had lived. I lived in a part what was the main hub of the 400,000 people. This was, first of all, 
as the, an intensive business part of the city, and there was uh, two uh, apartment uh, buildings where, but mainly were business area, uh, real estate in this part. What was the address of your home? I lived in three homes, but I will give you the main address. Well, the main address was Zamenhofer 17. This, before the name, the street was named Zamenhofer, the name was Jika. The name Zamenhof comes because my neighbor was the creator of the Esperanto language, which was a universal language for the world, and had uh, branches all over the world. And uh, the Society of Esperanto Linguists thought that this is going to prevent wars and misunderstanding, because if they are going to be an international language that people will be able to talk, they will not fight. And I knew this family. If you and I were standing in front of that home in Warsaw, what would I see? You would see that the second floor had a balcony, what was uh, the major things of the building. And on the ba balcony was a sign advertising our business. The sign was written in Polish, but sewing machines and office machines, Shah, Yoselson. Sha was the first the two letters, S-Z, for my father, and then the name. A smaller sign was before the entrance to the building was a Polish name for our business. What was Polska Centrala Maschin Rospent, because to do business with government agencies or with anti-Semitic <laughs> uh, 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 customers, this was more conducive to have a, a Polish name for a business. Did you live in an apartment building? Yes. In the same building, we had the second uh, floor was ha about three quarters was the uh, showrooms in the balance was an apartment and on the main floor inside was a warehouse a, a working room a technical room we have been ma the the main part of the building we have occupied ourselves How many floors did the apartment building have? The apartment building had originally four floors. And finally, two more floors were built over the apartment. There were six floors. <clears throat> In your apartment, Where did you sleep? I slept in the middle of, a, of an apartment. It was a small bedroom. And I have uh, slept in this bedroom and with my brother. And with two beds have been in the bedroom. Which brother? Benjamin. How many rooms? did the family have to live in? 
The family had a main uh, bedroom. The family had another bedroom and a big living room and dining room, what was combined. And of course, a kitchen and a bath. The bath was uh, not uh, an electric bath, but heated by with coal. The same thing, the water, the, the was cold, but in the kitchen was too heated with coal. In those times, where I would you could count on your fingers apartments where you had hot water and hot water baths in Warsaw. My mother had an apartment house in another part in, of this was considered an elegant apartment house because each uh, apartment had a bathroom. Mainly the, the apartment had no bathroom, had running water, but no. And the building of the apartments in Warsaw were made, uh, were different. Every building had a courtyard inside. And this was socially very conducive because people after work used to congregate on this courtyard. In a lot of elegant apartments, you had a little garden around this courtyard, and especially for this was conducive for teenagers and for children, a place to play and not to congregate on the streets. This was a, a very good thought to, uh, to, to bring up the younger generation in a more homely, closer atmosphere. What did your living room and your dining room look like? What was the furniture? The, the, the main furniture in the dining room was a big table where a lot of people have congregated during uh, holidays. And I would say, to give you a, an example, you had a lot of people who have been in difficulties to make a living because we had a business at the same time. So brokers and all kinds of people used to come up. And some people knew if they are hungry, they themselves went into the kitchen and cut themselves a piece of bread and sat, and sat down on the table and ate it. Ate. Was it a privilege to be invited into your home? It was a privilege, but a lot of uninvited people came to. Did you have books in your home? Yeah, we had books. We had uh, in one of the rooms where we had uh, a bedroom. We had a wall with books. Yeah, we had a lot of books in different languages, and especially in German. The German language was a very popular thing in our house because we have been doing business to a great degree with Germany. And I had a German governor who used to come to me weekends to study with me in original German philosophy. What language was spoken in your home? My father spoke Yiddish, but we among us have spoke Polish. My mother spoke, spoke Yiddish and Polish. My father was born not in Poland, but in Lithuania. 
and he finished at a Russian gymnasium. He was fluent in Russian. And this was a one important thing to his business success, because when he came to Poland, he was fluent in Russian, and the Polish Jewish businessmen were not fluent in the Russian language. So he has been uh, able to get in with the Russian buying offices, with the Russian military, and made very fr friendly connections uh, with them. And this was very uh, profitable for him uh, to start a business in, in Warsaw. Before being in Warsaw, he was with his uncle in Lithuania, in Vilno. My father's uncle was an inventor. He, was, he invented the first lamps that made a flame from gas under this. And he made a lot of money in, with this, to a point that the circus in Vilno was a big building belonged to him. And my father left uh, for Warsaw because he was promised, he promised him to make him a partner. But later he came back on his word. So he went to Warsaw to start on his own. What was your uncle's name? Krangel. What went on typically in your home in the evening when the kids came home from school? Congregation of a, a lot of people. Uh, my brother's friends, some have been uh, playing musical instruments, so that they played in the evening on a violin, in, on a trumpet, and my father in the other room had a lot of friends coming to him and talking politics. Partly business too, but mainly politics. The conversation was, my father was a Zionist. The conversation was on a political Zionist. This was the time of Herzl, of starting the movement, in, of the mandate, of the British mandate, and this was a very important factor in the Jewish circles. And of course, there have been political things on this. Sometimes the living quarters have been use, used for business too, because the, we haven't got enough place in the business quarters. For instance, we have been doing business with Germany. We have been doing business with the United States and with Great Britain. And we had to have correspondence in this language. So this correspondence used to be uh, part-time workers. They would one work three times a week, half a day. And they used to do their work in the living quarters, in the living room. What was your father's business? Sewing machines and office machines. Did you manufacture them or did you distribute other machines? We distribute and we partly manufactured. We and exported it. This was a business in the United States to export old fashioned machines, for instance, to India. Over there they used when we have been already advanced, they used still machines moving by hand and sitting on the floor. So the label in Poland was very cheap, and we had connections to buy in the United States these old-fashioned machines and to rebuild, re repaint, re in Warsaw and sell it to importers in India. You mentioned previously that you had many business dealings with Germany. What were they? The, uh, the Germany has manufactured parts for all sewing machines for the whole world. 
So we used to represent one of the biggest manufacturers in making parts for all machines from in Germany, in Dresden. This was a city in the... Then my father represented f big companies who made sewing machines for the industry, for the garment industry, for the shoe industry. And in, uh, we used to import and install these machines to, if somebody, for instance, went in and wanted to start a modern shop to make suits, we could give him a set of machines installed already then in a modern way for to, for, to start and to finish his suit with the making the buttonholes and finishing lapels in this. Till now, to a point when I go in to buy a suit, I touch this and I know what kind number of make this is. Because this tells you right away how this was made. It's, then we had office machines. We represented an English company who made typewriters, the Imperial typewriter. And we have been importing, rebuilds and for rebuilding typewriters from the United States. In those time already, the United States big offices used to change every five years this set of machines and give to uh, Underwood the, the machines what they used and take from him new one. We used to buy up from people who got this used machine, rebuild them and sell them in, the, in Poland and outside Poland in Europe. And my father used to have uh, for on the sewing machine about 40 people working, on the typewriters about 80 people working. And of course we used to sell wholesale machines to dealers who sold them to home users, to ladies. The, uh, the economic situation in Poland has been different. Ready-made uh, clothing was not as popular as in the United States now. Women made a living being at home, having a sewing machines, and they and she was a seamstress, made uh, uh, dresses and uh, for the neighbors in the whole building, and this has helped to a great degree support the family. So, uh, sewing machines was a popular thing in, in Poland. This was a tool to make a living, a tool to. Uh, better ma making the living. In the, our business was very known because of this. Where did your family get its clothes for the children? When I was a child, my clothes was bought in special stores what have uh, handled children clothing. But when I was already a young man, I used to pick out the cloth in a special clothing st cloth store that imported the cloth from England mo mostly. Poland made good clothes too and give it to a, there were two or three tailors who made clothing to measure. The, num the number one ones, but you had about 200 tailors who made a living to make for making clothes to order. The u usual thing, even if somebody was not financial enough, he used two to go in and buy a piece of cloth, uh, uh, three and a half, four yards, and give it to a tailor, and he finished for him the suit. And he measured four times the suit before he finished it. 
So do you see the sewing machine business was quite combined with popularity? Was your family religious? Yes, to a point. Was not orthodox to a point like you would see in the United States pe people uh, with uh, locks or this, but my father used to go to shul. I used to go with him when I was older and I have protested sometimes Saturday. And uh, and he, he was religious, but modern religious. You know, in the movement in Poland, in Europe, was in religion, in Jewish religion, Hasidim and Misnagdim. Misnagdim were the movement from the Vilna, from the Vilna Gaon, what was famous. My father was more religious on the, uh, taste of the Vilna Gaon. This was a worldly Judaism. What synagogue did he attend? He attended us in two synagogues. It was a synagogue across the street from us. It was called the Zolberg Synagogue. And this was a little, about five blocks from us, a more elegant synagogue with a chazan. In Poland, the synagogues have not been created like here. There were no rabbis in synagogue. The, syn the synagogue, the mem every member went to a cheder, what was here is called a yeshiva, and every member knew the laws of the Talmud, knew the laws of the uh, uh, of the uh, the basic laws of the, of Judaism, and there was not necessary a rabbi. Did you attend Hader? Yes, but a modern Hader for different classes, and. Uh, uh, I, I, but not too long. I interrupted the cheder, and I went to uh, to the gymnasium. Uh, this why I had to make a test in the gymnasium because I didn't start my education in the gymnasium. I went into the gymnasium to the third grade. This was already an advanced grade, you know, or because you had in the gymnasium a uh, children's grade, in a, then a, another grade, and then you went into the first grade. How many days a week did you attend Hader? Six days a week. How many hours? The whole day. I, uh, my mother used to send me dinner, uh, the lunch, the lunch of the, to the Hader. We're going to take a break now and change tapes. This is tape number two, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19, 1998. Can you describe some of your hater teachers? 
Yes, I think that I have to clarify for you the rabbi institution in uh, Poland, because this is very important, I feel. Because the uh, popular, po the populace of the people in the shuls have been very versed in Talmudic law, in Talmud, the rabbi had no place. This was a rabbi only who more, more or less make, uh, made a living from the Jews. Warsaw had only two main synagogues, the Plomatska Synagogue and the Nozick Synagogue. The Plomatska Synagogue had a rabbi, Professor Moises Shaw. This was a great Talmudic scholar in knowing languages, uh, 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 Polish and German and Hebrew, and he was a professional. And at the same time, he was a pro professor of the for, uh, Warsaw University of Judaistic subject. Then, the Nozick Synagogue has a, had a rabbi, Professor Balaban was his name. He was a pro he was a historian. In the same time. He was a professor of Jewish history on the university. These were the main rabbis. Uh, uh, you had teachers, Hebrew teachers, who were attached to the gymnasiums where people, boys like me or others, who used to go. And the gymnasiums used to have uh, the main language was done in Polish, teaching Polish, but they had. Hebrew in Judaistic subject, two hours a day. So these people have ta taught it. The rabbi in the United States is a different thing. The rabbi in the United States is a profession, like an accountant, like, like an entertainer. He is serving a community in a different way, the rabbi in uh, in Europe. This was not only in Poland, in other European uh, um, countries was the same thing. The institution of the rabbi in the United States is unique. That some, some, this became a, a place where a person has been going to school to go to make a living for a lifetime. This is important to understand the politics of the rabbinate in, in the United States. Did not exist. I you, you want me to describe my uh, teachers? I went to two, to three schools, the four schools of Hebrew. The first was Kaddish school. This was a, a school more uh, advanced uh, in the same building where we lived. On the, on the top floor was the, the school. I went then for a short time, and then I went to a school across the street that uh, had more advanced classes. And the third, I went to a school what a rabbi has rented a part for himself and had only 18 boys. And he has taught Hebrew and Talmud and his daughter was a teacher in a public school. So she used to come and te teach Polish and mathematics and history. This person has finished a famous yeshiva, and he had to make a living, so he made this. But he took boys from rich homes what could support him with his He never had more than 18 students. He had to pay uh, the rent in the other school. And in this school, I was bored, 
and I was uh, interested uh, in it. I was I was interested always in history. I wasn't in interested in the part of Gemara of laws because I felt that the laws what we had already in those time are too old to apply them. For instance, I felt that in the in the temple to have sacrifices from cows from this. I already rebelled what kind of sacrifice this is if you take a living thing and you put on the um, special place to uh, burn it and the uh, Kohen is, uh, is, is dividing it between his... Uh, this kind of thing has been rebelling in me, you, you, under, you understand? More of those things, there are, there are laws that if a coin has to eat the food, you have to have to take a part and put it on the away in a certain way. Otherwise, all the food what is co is not kosher. I felt I felt even, even that hen is a not a logical thing not to permit to eat, because you know there was a group of Jews who permitted to eat chicken with milk together, because there was three kinds of Jews. Uh, uh, the, the, the third part was Essenites. They permitted chicken with milk. And the, for, for instance, the prohibition to eat um, uh, ham was because of cleanliness. In those times, they couldn't clean the hem from these little insects. It was rational to, to forbid to eat hem. But in the time what I lived in Poland, the hygiene was already in a position to clean the hem from this insect, and this was forbidden. So the law, the Jewish law said that a uh, 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 um, meat you can eat only from a uh, uh, from from a cow because this is the the food she brings back in, in comes back to him and the hoof is split so a, a pig has no split hoofs this why the, and this was the the border. Uh, of what you can eat and what you cannot eat. So, so, oh, the, I was rebelling, I have to admit, on the laws. Because the halacha, even now, is written, the mother halacha is written in 19, in 1012 by, by my mother. This. If he would live now, he wouldn't read, uh, write the halacha the same. Did you debate religious issues with your father and brothers? I, I, I debated not so much with my father. My father and my mother were very angry of my rebellion. My, I told you, I had a, I learned mostly, not in school, home from my governors. I had a half a day a governor in every day, and I had a German during the weekend, the, the guy who was uh, my governor and, uh, during the week in the afternoons was a very intelligent person to a point that when he ran away from Poland, he became the professor of psychology, of psychiatry on the Moscow University. Lubnitsky was his name. Was his name. He gave me my basis of thinking. He put my mind in a direction what is going till now. And I am thankful to him. But I, have to, I had to hide from my family the conversation and the teachings what he, because they would fire him or because he was a non-believer completely but a very practical, intelligent person. At what age did you start working with him? I started working with him in the, about 
14. And he used to come, he was an adjunct in the Warsaw University, but he couldn't make a living. And he had a friend, so he used to come and eat dinner with us, and stay with, uh, with us. And finally, when he was a, a, a native from another, not from Warsaw, he was a native from Łódź, another city. And when he finished his job in Warsaw University, he went home. And I wanted him to have something for me what I knew he has, he has dreamt to have. He wanted to have a typewriter. And a typewriter was in those times a very costly thing for a person in his stage of earning. So I have seen to itself, to it, that I, somebody brought a typewriter to sell to my father who was not complete and who was in bad uh, condition. I bought the typewriter. I was very friendly with the workers who worked then for my father. And after the hours, they have rebuilt for me this typewriter. <laughs> and this I gave him as a present, my going back. And he promised me when he comes home on this typewriter, he will write a report of psychoanalysis of me. And he did. Was it unusual or typical for you to be tutored at home in the afternoon in addition to the other studies at school and on the weekend? Unusual. And who, who wanted that? Very rich people could afford them. Who was responsible for that? Your mother, your father? My mother. My mother finally somehow from, came out for me in this question, was very unhappy because she said, said that I changed, that I, I became an unbeliever. And she was very unhappy. And I did change. What do you remember about your mother? My mother, I remember that she was very thoughtful about the family, the cookings and the food, the preparation for the holidays and for this. And she was an elegant woman. She loved to dress elegant. She all her clothes were made to order by the best dressmaker in the breast tailor in Warsaw. She has a, a fair coat from the best in from the choice uh, skins always. She was tall, she was elegant and beautiful. My father was an older bachelor because he came before he was uh, in a position to support the family, he did not marry. My, f my mother was much younger than my father. My father was already, when he uh, married, about 35 years old. And she was young. But her old father was a very religious, ascetic man, with a beard till here, with a special capota, and she uh, was not in the vein. She, she had an uncle, this, this grandfather had a brother who was completely different who was an industrialist, and his wife was a world. So my mother used to spend more time in this uncle house than her father's and mother's house. What were, you, what were your mother's father and mother's name, her parents? My mother's father's name was Marble, official Marble, and the, ma, ma, her mother, Leia. Did you have any special foods 
in your home that were favorites of yours? My mother was so careful and so total that we have to have been six children and brothers. We had a cook and a maid that she cooked for everybody this what he likes. She could make three or four kinds of, of meat. Very important. Did you observe the Sabbath in your home? Yes. What was that like? Friday evening, everybody had to be congregated to dinner. My father used to go to show. I didn't go Friday evening. Saturday, I used to go with him to show. He came to home. He made the same thing, uh, tradition with the kiddush and the uh, the blessing over the chalas. And sometimes chalas have been have been baked at home. Uh, and usually the. Uh, the, the good housekeeper who have had good cooks and maid have been baking things at home. And this was made very thoughtful and very special. What was the typical Sabbath dinner? The typical Sabbath dinner was fish, two kinds of fish, boiled fish and, uh, and gefilte fish. Uh, then was a chicken soup with noodles, and then came meat. Well, it was almost four kinds of meat: chicken meat, uh, flank flanken, tongue, tongue, baked meat. Four kind, four kinds of meat, and then the desserts. Desserts were. F boiled food, uh, fruits from as the season was, and of course uh, the the um, the baked uh, uh, things with the uh, inside with uh, uh, with uh, fruit with all kinds of fruit, and of course uh, we were tea drinkers very much. What did the table look like? How was it prepared? The table was prepared with the most elegant tablecloths and salad, uh, embroidered each week different ones. And the silver was in the, the candelabras were the most beautiful ones. Who lit the candles? My mother lit the candles. Who said the prayers? My father. Where did you sit at the table? I sit at the table near my father, as the youngest. What about the other religious holidays during the year? observed very uh, rich with the ritual with all uh, d details did you and have a the the business was closed in uh, holidays and saturdays sometimes my when we were already grown up people my brother and i i in an important client uh, had to come friday and he was late so we have been waiting and my father was prepared to go to shul. He was very angry if we did not close the business. Did you have a favorite holiday? Yeah, I liked uh, holidays. Uh, Passover was a holiday was what I uh, liked. In, in, in general, I liked the Shabbat. Were you bar mitzvah? Yeah. The bar mitzvah was not the way how you have here bar mitzvah with, with pardons. You went to shul, you were, t you were called to the Torah, you said you part of the uh, Torah, 
and the people uh, uh, congratulate you, and they then the people went for a kiddush home to the parents of. We lived very close to the and. Dairy things have been prepared, salad herrings and uh, uh, cold drinks, and this was the bar mitzvah. Who prepared you for your bar mitzvah? I tell you frankly, I wasn't suppo supposed to be prepared because from Heide I knew the part. You understand? Everybody knew the part. This was, the, this was a different thing, you understand? Here, everybody who let, let go a beard and he puts a, a, a black hat is a rabbi. But this is not a rabbi. You understand? The rabbinate in usually in Poland consisted to, of a business part. What was the business part of rab a rabbi? Each precinct had a rabbi what the Kehila used to support, and you couldn't be married or have a birth certificate unless you went to your precinct to this rabbi, and you had to bring... Uh, uh, Gentiles had the church, and the church kept the, You had to bring I think five uh, witnesses to with you to the precinct, and they have written a statement in the witness that a male or female child was born, named this and this, and this was the ceremony. Completely different, and all this uh, 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 act went into a special archive for Jews, and if you needed a birth certificate, you had to go to this archive. If you wanted a passport, and you needed it. It was a different... The Kehillah, the Jewish Kehillah, was a independent, uh, independent institution that could levy taxes on the Jews in, the, in this uh, neighborhood, and the taxes was collected by the government for the Kehila. was a completely different uh, institution, more organized, more disciplined. The same is the, uh, the burying somebody. The cemetery was running by the Kehila. But, and if you, I, for instance, had a, a terrible incident when my father passed away, I announced in the Jewish paper that the, uh, that the burial will come from our house one o'clock. And I went to the Gmina to settle with them the place, and I had to make a, a pay a certain amount of money. We had opin an opinion as rich people. So the guy who has uh, been in charge of it came out with, to me with an astronomic amount of money. And I have been heckled, and he knew that I have to have it settled till one o'clock. And I wanted a place in the main alleya as you went in on the cemetery. I heckled with him the whole day, and this was not a good feeling for me, the day when my father died. And I remember till today the unpleasantness what I had this day in the Jewish Gemina. And finally, I had to agree to a very, to a sum what would be now $50,000. If I, In what other ways did the Kahila influence Jewish life in Warsaw? They have run a hospital for Jews. And, and Jews who wouldn't uh, pay have been accepted over there without pay. And some uh, very primitive Haters have been supported by the very primitive, you know, only the very 
two people took advantage of it. And the politics were so in the it was supposed to be a democratic institutions and voting for the for the board. So the the populace in Warsaw consists of the leftists, of socialists, the Bund and the communists, the Zionist <coughs> and the religious Aguda of the, with the, uh, no, they didn't wear blowing black hat, they like wear uh, velvet caps over there. And they have been, and the Zionists haven't been good organized. The Bund has been good organized, and they have been good, and they have both have been polit political and trying to bring in the Zionists to have the hand on the Gemina. This was a very important uh, position, the president of the Gemina. And a lot of politicking went on before the voting, in handling and exchanging, exchanging favors and all those things. And you have to have con connection, connection, not to levy with a very high tax, too. What were some of the other Jewish businesses in Warsaw, predominantly owned Pre and run by Jews? Predominantly was the needle industry, 99% in Jewish hands, clothing, Shoemaking was a, the furniture industry was in in Jewish and building was in Jew real estate was in Jewish and, and this made the Jews financially very important to a point that the Germans were prepared because they had good information. They came to Poland with the idea, knowing that the Claudish industry is Jewish. You understand? They knew, knew what is what going on. Everything was. They had a, a complete guide. What they have to do, where they have to go for certain things in order to. To, to be able to manage. We're going to take a break now and resume in a moment. This is tape number three, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19, 1998. What year did your father pass away? He passed away in 1986, in December. What impact did that have on your life? This had a, a very big impact. In the whole sickness of my father before he dies was a impact in a change of way of thinking on me. Uh, the um, uh, medicine was on a very low level. Cardiology even a, a lower level. 
the best cardiologist used to come to our house to see my father. Vienna was in those times on the highest degree in cardiology. And this was a professor or, uh, on the Vienna Medical School, Wenkenbach, who was considered the number one cardiologist. And his books in cardiology are used in translation till today. So we have tried to get him to Warsaw. This was a visit of this uh, man to Warsaw was about $25,000. And uh, he had to have uh, people with him. In generally, we had in our house when my father was already seriously seeing a nurse in a doctor, 24 hours. And this Wenkenbach came and he couldn't do anything. The, the cardiology was in such a law when I see what they do now. I cannot believe that such a backward uh, thing could, be, could exist at all. And my father's death made on me a... I just grew up overnight. This is difficult to describe the change what have occurred in my thinking in my life this time. But uh, life went on and my mother was, uh, was alive. And <clears throat> my brother, who was the main person in the business, was already engaged in the, those times. Which brother? Benjamin. <coughs> My older brother, was the, Abram, was not a businessman. He was a technician. Benjamin was a businessman. And my two sisters, the oldest, went in business for themselves together. Not with their husbands had, had a different business businesses. And my brother, when he was engaged, went out of the business and he has started a business for, for, themselves, for himself. So you can see the, our business has like split in three persons and everybody has been pulling in a nice way on his side. Uh, on, in his side. In the start of dissensions in the family, I have to admit. My mother was in the middle and she couldn't do anything. My sister, Sarah, was with me. And this uh, oldest brother, Abraham, and he was not a businessman. So this is the time when I had to quit school from the sixth grade. I saw this, that all oh, I have to continue my life as I continued to be, be a free will, uh, go lucky person, uh, or to start seriously to pull together the business and see this business. I saw that this, this was written on the walls, I saw, and I decided that I wanted the business should exist. And I went into the business. How old were you? I was about uh, 16, going on 17. And I made a plan that first I have to consolidate the farm points of the business in Germany, mainly because we did a lot of business in Germany. And then in, uh, in New York. And I went in it in, to be frank with you, with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength. I was very successful. Unusually successful. To describe to you how inexperienced I was, I went the first time to Germany. 
And I went to Dresden, to this main manufacturer of parts, who was a big part of our business and of what we used to represent them. And I came to Dresden and I was overwhelmed. I saw a factory on four blocks in where thousands of workers are working. And here I was a young boy. I never had to do, do business and relationship in this way. So when I had to open up the door to the entrance, I got scared and I withdrew. I withdrew to a point that I, wo I walked around for about an hour around the blocks and I thought what to do. Finally, I mentally put myself to a certain uh, uh, way at ease and I told myself, I cannot go back home not to go in and to see. And I opened up the door. I was greeted by a receptionist. I knew the language already, to not so fluent like I know now, but I used, I knew to converse from my times with my governor. And in school I took up German too. And I was good in, in language as always. This, this, uh, uh, receptionist was like an angel for me. She was smiling. She received me in a way but put me to a certain degree at ease. And she brought me into a room and asked me to sit down and said she will call the person who is in charge of this. And I was waiting and came in a man who was uh, 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 an executive. His name was Miller. And he right away knew who I am, and he knew the history of our business, and he put me at ease to a, to a degree. I spent with him the whole day. He introduced to me, me to the top, and for him was it too fun that a young boy like this, he hasn't got clients in my age who are coming to visit him from overseas. So a certain relationship has been built up from the first look. He on me and, and I, I on him that he was pleasant and he was, and he was knowledgeable and he knew a lot that I didn't have to. What was, I, excuse me, what was his name? Miller. And I walked out from there successfully cementing a relationship what was very, very important. From over there, I went back to Berlin, where we had a relationship with a Jewish company with whom, uh, whom I knew, because the owner of the company has two sisters, and they used to visit, with, uh, to visit us, and he, to a degree, has been trying to make passes on my sister, and yeah. So, but he had a German girlfriend. I, him, I knew. So I made with them uh, deals. What what were they tried to do everything to make it easy for me. And from there, I went to to Aachen. This was on the border of Holland in Germany, where a needle manufacturer with whom my father, we have done business, who was very, a big part of our volume. And I unusually was successful as of a first trip to cement the three corner points what I wanted to, to hold. And I went back. And this gave me a lot of courage. Was this your first trip to Germany? First trip to Germany, yeah. yeah. What was the environment like? Very pleasant. I loved the order of what they have had. I loved the, the, the uh, education what I met in the people, yeah. 
and I felt that they are culturally far more advanced with the Poles. And I liked it, to be frank with you. I got to know the, the importance of titles over there because I saw when people registered in the hotel, I went as a young boy into a hotel register, so I gave my name and but over there I saw other people came, so they raised of her, I am the director of this and this and I am this. They, they spelled out a whole litany of, of titles. So I already learned one thing that titles are impo an important thing in Germany. <laughs> in, little by little, I learned the habits of the countries, country and the way of living in the, I checked in, in the, to the most luxurious hotels always, because this is the place. I decided to go on a, I had to drop out from school, but I told myself I am going to invent and then for me, a, a, a university of practical life through traveling. And I did. I learned on, on all, all my travel. I tried to make contacts with Jewish families too. I was once in a family, but they took me and on an evening, Saturday evening, on a, dan on a dance for Jewish uh, youth, and I learned how they behave, what was their flirt, what was this. I came in in an environment, not just I went to the country to do business. I learned how the country lives and how people behave and all those, those things, and what kind... I learned the thing what gave me a lot of thing in my life. I learned how to use social contacts for business. And this was important. My social contacts have opened up for me the doors in Italy out to the president for my studying the university of life through traveling. I used this as an important factor in the f with premeditation. What I feel too now, that this is more important than theoretically sitting in school and, and studying a book of history. This I could do on my own by reading. I read very slow, but I read Toro because I have a little dyslexia. And this makes me studying not to read. And I do study, so I, and my memory was good. So I tell you that the, the, my life went through with a self-created university in a self-created way of study. In school, for instance, where I was still sixth grade, I was, for me, after I studied, I had my, my uh, governor, was it a joke? I could do in a month this what the class did in a year. Because I had this governor who was very clever who could help me. So for, for instance, mathematics, I could do in a, in a month this what was in a year. So I used to not to work in school, rather work at home with my, uh, with my governor. When you were in Germany, what was the political environment like? The political environment was not, even in, in Jewish families, to a degree, so dangerous as it is real uh, has been. They have tried to fool themselves that this is only a political thing what will disappear. What did you see? 
I have seen the same thing. They were pleasant to me. They were pleasant in business. And the companies, what I have been in touch, have been very liberal. For instance, there was, was one, one company in Bielefeld, what we represented. There was a part of Poland what was more German with Polish, what the Poles have uh, got uh, when Wilson has uh, partitioned the Eastern Europe. So Germans have been in the same business. These Germans didn't want to do business with me. They wanted to do direct with the German company. And this German company has refused to do business with them. They demanded they should go through us that we are the general representative and they will not do business with them. When you were in Germany, did you ever experience any anti-Semitism? No. No. Pleasant socially, and I do, did not experience. I experience only a terrible nationalism, what Hitler has injected in the, in the brains of the Germans. For instance, when Hitler took over Austria, I was in Berlin, and I was in the biggest hotel in Berlin, and I was sitting in the dining room and consuming, and I saw how the German people, industrialists from the higher class, with what kind of a way they have gre greeted themselves, that the Anschluss was down and Austria was ours, with a feeling of conquering the world. This gave me a, a very important mind. I, of course, I was in Germany after the Kristallnacht. Yeah. And I know that the Germans are making this kind of anti-Semitic, uh, I knew. But I personally, with the business of what I dealt, did not feel it. They, uh, they wanted to export and they tried to avoid any kind of difficulties but people came for, bus for, Im for, for business to import from Germany with premeditation. I saw this, this I saw. So I was four times a year in Germany. I never, I never felt this. I was in Germany about four weeks before the war broke out. What did you learn? What did you think I, was I, happening I, I to I the felt, Jews? I, in Germany I didn't feel it so, but I went from Germany, we, do, we did business in France. I went to France and I met with business uh, acquaintances who received me royally. I was the, f uh, when Chevalier came the first time on the B on the stage. I was on the show in, in, in the in the theater in, in Paris. Those times, of course, this made on me a tremendous impression because the difference between Poland and in France or Italy. I was in Italy, and I my last uh, uh, stop was London. I came to London not knowing English at all. But I went because we had a connection in this business in, uh, in uh, London. And I went into a good hotel and I stayed overnight. And I remember one thing what I had. I didn't know English and I did not know how to pronounce reading in English. So the, the business what, with whom I was wanted to call was on the Com on the commercial road. Commercial, if I pronounced in the way how you pronounce in Polish, in, the, in German, was commercial road. Com commercial. In English you would pronounce it commercial. 
So I went down and asked the doorman on the hotel how I go to the commercial to the commercial road. He says, I don't know a street like this. I stopped the policeman and asked where I go to the commercial road. I stopped the taxi driver and he didn't know where I was going. Finally I stopped the man on the street and he saw that I, so they said, you mean the commercial road? And he opens up my mind. I went to a taxi driver and he took me to the place of the commercial. This, this, to this point, I was ignorant in the English language. When you were... But when I was in England, I already know and I was uh, uh, convinced that the war was broken down. Because the afternoon papers with the headlines, Danzig is this and Danzig, they will, they will walk in and all those things. And I, in the hiding time and all this, I always were thinking, why I have not uh, fractured the leg in London. <laughs> but I went back because my mother was a widow and I saw that this is, I cannot leave her, my, de my sister. From a point of, I knew that this is coming, but from a point of obligation, I could not leave them and stay in England. This, this was my last trip to, to Germany, to France, to the, I sold in France certain equipment to a businessman, and I shipped the equipment before breaking out the, the war. After the war, when I came to, to uh, Munich, I went to France, I will tell you how. And I collected, this was an honest man, he paid me for the equipment. Had there been any discussions at home when you were in Warsaw about the rise of the Third Reich? Yeah. My brother was against thinking that something serious is going to be. I remember a big discussion when the Olympic in Berlin has been. And I was for it that we have to take it serious. That the mentality of the Germans are getting in in the mood of the Nazis. And people didn't want to believe in it. People saw it, but they did. This was so horrible that they don't want. They have refused to see reality. In my last trip to Germ trips to Germany, I started to smell the reality. I saw the attitude of the populace in this world, and I saw that my friend with whom I had the business who was making passes to my uh, sister who had a German f uh, girlfriend for years. This ge ge German girlfriend was his girlfriend for about 10 years. And this was like a marriage among, among them. And he was accused against her will from uh, Rassenschand for having a gen this is the law was called Rassenschaft, and he was put into Dachau for Rassenschaft. So this gave me the opening that I came close, and the street what they used to be was a Jewish street, Grenadierstrasse was the street. They, they, they renamed after the guy whom they accused in burning the parliament in Berlin, Host Wesselplatz, they, they renamed it. This was a no Nazi. And all this, I give you the details, the sanctions, what put in my mind, the, and I took it serious more with the people around me in Warsaw. When you were in Germany, did you ever see any political parades? Not big ones, but I saw the wearing the swastika, the the SA group, the SA, 
in the SSSR was the group what they told, uh, took from the populace. The SS was the young people put in, in the, from where the Gestapo was from. But I was very free. I had girl, German girlfriends. I used to go out with them, and they did not make any remarks. You, you understand? In Bielefeld, very pleasant, very, uh, very nice, socially uh, conducive. I have to admit that I I liked my company in Ger in Germany, and this helped me. What was your life like after? the Germans attacked Poland? It was a horrible thing to be during the week when they walked into the, to Poland and they started as an example made Warsaw that they wanted Poland should cap capitulate, they demanded. And they bombed the town 24 hours. Bombing buildings, and you saw building coming down from top to the other, to the to the bottom, a, 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 a mountain of of, of bombed uh, uh, things. And uh, uh, we have been going from. Uh, from building to building to say with the family together in the in, in the uh, in the cellars and all those things. This was a um, nothing to buy, no food, no, everything stopped, and we saw the first signs of the terrible. They started to catch Jews on the street and make them work for their household needs, for cleaning up a building what was not completely ruined in order they should be able to make their police headquarters. And, and they have designated a part of Warsaw, the German circle, the Paul where they expelled the Poland even, only Germans, and they caught Jews to, to do the manual work uh, on the streets, in, in the trucks, in this, in the some even did not come back home from a day of work. I, I was only once caught on, uh, on a street for work. I was caught and they took me to a railroad station where there, ha there have been bus cars for, um, with, uh, from, uh, for calls. We're going to take a break now and resume in a moment. <coughs> This is tape number four, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19th, 1998. You were describing the first week with the bombings and the occupation of Warsaw. 
Of course, the occupation was bad because all of a sudden all stores closed, bumped out most of Warsaw, a lot of people uh, with uh, injuries, a lot of people have lost their, uh, uh, their apartments, their place of living. Poles and Jews, the whole populace of uh, Warsaw. And uh, uh, they started a struggle. The German army started gradually to come in and take on quarters in Warsaw, in the buildings that are been, have been habitable in around Warsaw, and started a problem for Jews. Jews have been afraid to go out from their homes, to go out from their hiding places, because they caught them in, in, in for work. I, I explained to you that I was caught one time. I was taken to a railroad station. I was giving a, a what, how do you call it, a, a thing to put in coal from the box car. Shovel? Not a shovel, a, a basket. A basket from the box car. And they wanted me to bring it out but not empty it on the bottom, but on the top of the coal, what already was about one uh, uh, story high. So in this was slippery to go up on with the coal and go on the top. And if you did not do it, they have been hollowing and some people couldn't do it. So they hit them, you know. So I went through the day and I came home from call, you can understand, black on my face and black of my hand. And from this on, day on, I was very careful already not to go out on the street. The moment I did hear uh, uh, trucks of this sound, I used to run in to a building on a last floor to, to let them go through, and I was successful, being so careful that I wasn't caught anymore. How did they know you were Jewish? Uh, they knew. Uh, the Jews were scared, and the scarcity has been in their eye, and they have been running away. Uh, so they know. Uh, in the Polacks, not knowing uh, Germans, used to say, "I not you, I not you," <laughs> you know. So uh, they caught you something in the beginning. Did you ever have to wear anything that identified you as a Jew? Yes, after a few weeks was the law, the the uh, the order that all Jews have to wear a uh, white. Uh, band with a Zion on it. This was the Warsaw way of uh, marking the Jews because in other places they put a yellow uh, uh, Zion. But Warsaw was a blue and white. And I wear that. But I did not, in the beginning, I did not, I didn't know what to do. I saw that bad things are coming. I started to, to listen to the underground station on the radio, came in an order that all Jews have to bring in to a point all the radios they cannot have. All Poles later couldn't have a radio, no communication. In the beginning they left the telephones functioning and the uh, Kehila made contact with a uh, uh, office for contact, the, the Kontaktstelle für, für die Gemeinde. And they used to uh, let them 
bring in uh, some food and start they started to uh, cook lunches and dinners very meager with a piece of bread and handed out to Jews who came in. I have to admit that after a few weeks I, I have been hiding food in a lot of places, uh, kashas, uh, flowers to bake, all those things that we started to have food in the building. What we lived has survived. We cleaned it out and my mother was in the building and we... And uh, as we uh, cleaned it up, some people who worked for us started to come back for work and we started to see if this will be possible to function in, in this. In the course of this, this was the first few weeks, Germans started to come asking for sewing machines in conversing with them in trying to find out what conditions are I saw that the quartermasters who were sent were versed what in the conditions knew what when I'm in Poland and in Warsaw and I so smelled out that the army wanted to use the Warsaw Jewish populace for their use for uniforms, for shoes, for clothing. And in the conversation I found out too that historically the upper echelon remembers how Napoleon was defeated in Russia because of the lack of clothing and lack of main thing, what, things. And I was meditating over this. And I was meditating how to make use of it. Of it. Some what came in, the Ger Germans, have been Germans who came from Germany. In some have been Poles who were of German descent. They were rather, Volksdeutschen they called them, they were rather ra right of a adapted in a special card with special privileges, with privileges to arrest uh, pe people, to, to take whatever they want from Jewish homes, from this. In, uh, I saw that every day brings a new bad thing, not a... But to a degree in the first uh, two months, this has normalized to a certain degree, that Paul started to want merchandise from the Jewish na neighborhood, from Jewish uh, merchants who survived some of the merchandise. And uh, the, the Jewish life just became very brutalized in very disordered. The Jewish mafia took over the, 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 the whole life of, uh, of, the, of the Jewish neighborhood. It was always don't think that all Jews have been angels in Warsaw. You had the Jewish thieves, you, have, you had Jewish owners from Bordellos, you had, you had a normal Jewish po populace, you had scientists, you had doctors, you had all kinds of people. And the lower class who have been used to unruly underground things took over. Police was not police, you could nothing. Do. The strength of your hand has governing, governing your life. 
for instance, in certain businesses, they put up posts, and if somebody sold something, a part of the sale has to be given to this guy who was staying in watching that nothing should come out from the business. <laughs> and you couldn't do nothing. Police was not police, you know, all those things. The Gmina has organized, a, a, by the order of the Germans, a Jewish police. And they gave them hats with blue bands here. And some prominent lawyers became commissioners of the Jewish police in the Gemina, what they ordered. Some of the people have been honest people and they became commissioners in order to save their life. Some of them have been underworld people who have been on the service to the Germans, Jews, you understand? Some of the Jews have wanted good life. They started to be on the services of the Germans. Some of Jewish beautiful girls who have been actresses and who have been uh, singers in this became girlfriends of the Germans. They wanted a good life. In, in some hotels, you go, was one hotel, Britannia, called, called on the Novolipia, where you find the highest officers of uh, the uh, Gestapo, and you find the most beautiful Jewish girls, and the and Jewish guys who were on the services of the German, and you could find the finest meals, the finest wine, the finest champagne, and the best music. Yes, you have to tell the truth. That this, of course, this was a great minority, but this, this minority was on the top. And what was on the bottom? On the bottom was very bad. I will give you an example how the condition was of this order were. I had connection with the Swedish embassy in Warsaw. The department or the, the co commercial attaché was a very close friend of a friend of mine. And we got him to agree that he should allow to the Swedish warehouses to take a part of, of my merchandise. And we hired big horse and wings because you had very few trucks then. Also. And we sent out to this uh, magazine zines about thousands of new sewing machines, the best ones. And I knew that in case things have to, I will get along with this commercial attaché. He didn't want for me anything, to be frank with you. He, do, he, he told me that he's doing it as a gesture of decency. All of a sudden, after two months, come these guys who have been the guys who have had the, the horse and wings, and they asked me to give, to give them a sum of money, otherwise they will go to the Gestapo and tell them that the merchandise what are in the warehouses of the Sweden are Jewish merchandise, are my merchandise. And what do you do in a case like this? This was, uh, losing the merchandise is one, but they called you on the Gestapo, and you, from the Gestapo, very few people came back. I went for, <laughs> for advice to a lawyer, what we used to have a business lawyer, a very intelligent, a very fine man. I found. So he says, Leon, there's no law. There's no, what can I tell you? What can I tell you? I don't know what to tell you. This, uh, this, uh, this is terrible. But I am not a giver up. 
I knew the Polish head from the criminal police in Warsaw. I knew him from certain uh, dealings. The Germans, when they came into Warsaw, couldn't, didn't bring in a whole criminal police from Germany and a whole police. They bring, brought in a few officers, German, who took the charge of the criminal poli police, but they left the Poles who have been on the top, and they have been on the order of the German police. So I went to the head of the Polish poli police, Szabranski was his name, I remember. And I told him that I have a, bit, a thing like this, ask him what to do. You know what he told me? This cost $5,000. For $5,000, all this guy will be arrested. We will get an order from the Gestapo, but they will be sent for, uh, for inter, inter, interviewing, but they will never come back from the interview. And this how this was. This kind Oh, you lived in this kind of situation. No law, no decency, nothing what can be. And I saw the time is little by little coming to the point. What I foresaw, the, what is going to be. I told you, I moved out from my apartment with my, where I lived with my mother to another apartment where I lived. And uh, my friends used to congregate there. Did you have to move? Were you compelled to move? I was not compelled. I felt that I, I wanted to have my own apartment. I could do. And I, in this apartment, I could do certain things what were not legal according to, in order to keep myself. For instance, you couldn't have for yourself an apartment. You could have for four people a room the most to sleep. But I wanted privacy, and I wanted, and I did not go by the law. This I saw, that the law should not exist for me. I should do things what I feel is saving me. So I take to, to this apartment, and from one room, I made a tailor shop. I put a mannequin in a sewing machine. A tailor shop could already ex exist and have that. In the other room, I made a bedroom. So I, I had some people with me, but I had only a housekeeper, and, and I lived in the apartment. And I organized myself a little social life. All my friends used to congregate in my apartment because I was the only one who had a place for myself. What happened to your financial assets after the Germans came in? The financial asset, my, my mother still, with my brother, still lived in the apartment what we had. And the financial asset, what, and some people came to work to. And I right away foresaw what is going to go on. I told you, a certain asset I sent out to the Swedish embassy. A certain asset I sold to Poles what I could for bargain prices. And I opened up a store in the Polish neighborhood of uh, Warsaw and sent to this store a certain amount of my assets and g took a Paul as a manager of the play place and that he should manage the business. And I told him, he was a son of a technician with whom my father used to do business, whom we know very, very well. And his sister married a Jewish fellow who was the head of the government travel office office. And I thought that this environment, what this guy has been and his father, that he can be reliable. But after a while, 
I saw that we send out merchandise, nothing comes back, and I wanted to see what is going on. So I got myself a permit to go out from the ghetto to the Polish neighborhood. And I came in, so I saw him walking out, and he, in, in right away when he came back, a Polish policeman came in, and he asked me what I am doing here in this neighborhood with a band with this. So I says, I, I have a permit to come, so I wanted to see a friend. He did not count on it that I have of an official permit from the Gestapo to go out. But I already saw with what it spells, that he is a dishonest guy, that I will not go in, that he wanted me to be arrested, arrested that I shouldn't be able to go to. I just give you the certain facts what has, uh, what has happened. When was the ghetto established in Warsaw? The ghetto was established by 1941. The building of the ghetto started in Forde still the, uh, took about a year till they walled up the whole thing. Who built the wall? Jews built the walls under the uh, supervision of the Gmina and the Jewish police and the German have supervised that too. And they made openings on the wall where German police Polish police and Jewish police there. And only through this opening, merchandise could come, food come in, merchandise could, could come out and people could go out to work in German establishment and come back to, through it under the supervision of the Germans, of the Poles and of the Jews. One of this opening was on the Zelazna in Lesznosit. We will come to it. I will tell you what this is. This is a very important factor. And as I lived in those time, I started to have connections with, uh, with the Germans who used to come, the quartermaster. And I smelled out what they come and what they want. I smelled right away out that they want to move divisions to the north. To, to prepare themselves to be closer to the Russian border. I knew for sure that uh, uh, in spite of the pact what they make, that this is a falsehood that they want to go into Russia too. That this is the... Uh, and I already saw that they are preparing themselves with clothing to go into Russia, because they remembered, because the quartermaster came with a platoon to Warsaw to prepare habitation for a division. So what did he do? He looked from not out bombed out buildings. He looked for equipment to make a kitchen as much as he can, not to... They didn't want to send from Germany because this was too valuable, the work, the German workers for the front for them. They looked to, to equipment to make, uh, make a, a, a washing facility and a cleaning facility because you have 7,000 people in a division. You have to clean the clothing, you have to change the under the clothing, the shoes have to be repaired, uniforms are torn, so you need a household. And a household need washing facility, cooking facility, sewing facility, and shoemaking facilities. This is a big thing to care for 7,000 people with all those things. And I saw that I can fit in with privileges, having sewing machines and owning them in this point. Do you understand? I smelled it out after a while. I have to tell you that this came about 20, 25 quartermasters like this. Some civilians 
some military guys. In this 25, a small percentage have been decent people with whom I could, who enjoyed to sit down with me and spoke in their language and they couldn't find a conversation like me. And from these people I learned a lot. For instance, came a guy, a quartermaster, who was in civilian, a professor of music in the Aachen University. And after talking with him, he told me, I am not going to grab from you the machine and not pay for it. I want you to know. I am told to grab for you, but I am not doing this because I know what humanity means and what honesty means. This is what he told me. I want to pay you how much you want for the use of the machine. I told my superiors, they have to give me the money, I, otherwise I don't go to say this. So I told them, listen, and when we move to another division, to another place, I will bring you back your machines, you should know. And this is how this was. He used to bring me money. I told him the money is not useful to me. I told him that I want coffee. I want to, you know. And when they moved the division closer to the border, one day, four days in the morning, trucks came in and brought me back the machines. Came another guy from Austria. So he wants, and he told me too, I want to pay you. So I told him, I, don't, I cannot buy nothing for the money. I won't bring me food. So he said, what do you want to food? So I told him, I want sugar, I want coffee, I want tea. Uh, tea. My mother needs oranges and fruit, bring me. So he says, okay, every month I will bring you a package. And he did. In conversation, when I started to converse with him, came out why he is doing it. He was working for a Jewish big clothing firm in Vienna. And he came into this uh, job as a young boy and he almost grew up like a member of this Jewish family. You understand? And he told me, Hitler cannot tell me what Jews are because I know what Jews are. I grew up in this family, you understand? And he, t to a point that he needed thread and all kinds of things, so he says, please tell the other people if they have uh, hidden some, this they shouldn't be afraid of me because everybody is afraid of me and I cannot get anything. Whatever. I will bring them money or food, whatever they need. If and if they don't want it, it's not enough. They have the right not to give it to me. And I did it for him. And he kept his uh, word. So you see, from these people, I found a lot, a lot out what the policy is, what is going to be. You, you understand? But the problem is that the percentage of these people was only about one or two percent from the global P Germans who came to me. One was wanted to kill me almost. But I have very much learned for them and for from and I learned how they changed their character. I told you, I was once when they came in to Warsaw on the balcony in our place before I moved to my own place. And across the street from us were the wholesale big clo clothing and textile businesses. So I see trucks coming we're going to take a break now and resume in a moment. You, you, you understand? But you want stories.
This is tape number five, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19th, 1998. The time came when Hitler decided to come to Warsaw the, the first time to see how successful he, uh, he was in the war, in the Blitzkrieg, what they called. And with him came a lot of military personnel and a lot of Gestapo personnel. And I saw trucks coming in to the neighborhood where I lived and stopping in the side street and out of the trucks, uh, sergeant, uh, lieutenants, captains, uh, po uh, the Gestapo police, and they all went to the street across the street where we had the business, where all the wholesale textile places have been. What do I see? That they are breaking off the doors and going into these places, and each one walks out with a piece of fabric for suits, a piece of fabric for dresses, all ca and they cannot carry it so much they each one took. They stopped used to help them carry it to the truck. And I, my mind started to work. Then. What has happened? How? Did I knew that the Germans are thieves or robbers? My outlook of Germany has completely changed in this moment. I, do, I just cannot see the transition in my brain. All of a sudden, I kept them in high, in a, in a high spirit, and all of a sudden, I see that they are the lowest of the lowest of what has happened. And this gave me a source of meditation. I came in meditating to a source that the Hitler, uh, the Magri, this speech, what he has made, what is in my, in my mind, when he, the war uh, finished, he said, what do we want from the world? We want a Lebensraum only. We want to have enough food, enough clothing, enough materials for our factory. This is what we want. The only thing what he is not mentioned, but we want it and we are going to steal it from somebody in order to have it. And this was a theory what he has implanted in the people. Stealing is, and robbing is a legitimate thing. After my meditation, I walked away with this. Then I walked away with this thought, I told myself, I have to be with Hitler. I have to go in his line to be a winner. I have to start teaching Germans how to steal and how to enrich themselves and in this way to sabotage them. Because I came to a um, conclusion that to live and to survive is not enough. You have to do something. And to do something, you have to buy, find a way how to be able to bring them down to a point to help them lose the war. And after these thoughts, I came and I made a plan. What was so pl simple, but this was so easy, I implemented it so easy, and I took such chances that I wouldn't, I cannot believe now what I did. In the meantime, I moved to a place on the Solna Street, where I had my own apartment, where I have had neighbors around me, and I started to be very lonely, because the uh, curfew started six o'clock. You couldn't go out on the street. You had all Jews couldn't walk out from the building between si uh, after six or sometimes seven. So, during the day? During the evening. During the evening. So, uh, this planted in me a thought the first time 
that maybe marriage is a is a uh, way of to outgrow from this lonely new life. In the new place where I moved by myself, I have arranged somehow a club of my of all my friends, male and female. Twice a week, once a week, they, they all came in the afternoon to my house. In some stayed overnight because after seven o'clock she couldn't go already home. And a social life st I started to build with these people in the ghetto. In the terrible times, we have prepared some poems to read on in the evening, with some jokes apropos the whole story of, li of life. And in the middle, I have occupied an apartment that was illegal, but I was not entitled to have for myself uh, a, bedroom, uh, a bedroom with a living room and a dining room in a, in a maid's place. So I, uh, I told you, I made a part of it a tailor shop. And because the controllers what came from the, uh, from the UNRWA to control it were all boys in my age or boys in, in, in Anya's age. So they come, they saw what is this, but they saw me, so they went home and didn't do nothing. Well, what was their job? To control. to control if the apartments are taken up legally more minimum four for a room. The, a kitchen even considered this was considered a room. You un you understand? Was a job yeah. with a Huden rot desirable? Uh, was desirable and uh, but to a degree I feel was not fulfilled willingly in a way what has helped the German. I don't accuse Chanyakov that he was on the, on the German, uh, uh, or that he was uh, a stooge or he worked for them, but I accuse him of be, being a, not a strong man with a low, short vision. He thought by giving in that he will save people. And this was the opposite. And in the same time when the uh, social life was, uh, uh, was in my apartment and among the, uh, the females who used to come up on, on my social art was Anya. And uh, Anya had a boyfriend before me who unfortunately has died very tragically. He, this was a typhus epidemic, and a lot of people, young people, died. There was no help, uh, nothing. And she wanted to uh, get married very, very much. And she, the only thing that attracted me that she was very open. She told me that she wants to get married, that she wants to marry me. You know, and I, as I told you, this was a time where psychologically, this comes as a, a psychological preparation till a person act. I was psych psychologically prepared, and the circumstances prepared me psychologically to the to the, in the from the times. And uh, I decided to marry her because she was so up means so frank about it. In spite that I knew a lot of females in those times, her friends who she does not know till now that they have made passes, I, passes I should marry them. <laughs> her, her best friends. And uh, we lived together in this apartment what I uh, had. And this was rebuilt and up a certain uh, way of life for the circumstances. Money was no problem for me. I could have everything 
because people could survive, I knew not for long, if they had a sewing machine, because the German factory registered them as workers, and with the register of the workers, they didn't have to go to the Umschlagplatz. You understand? So I could sell for any price my sewing machines, what I had, and I, this was, and in, 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 as I told you, I have manipulated so that I gave the Germans as many machines as they, as they want. But they gave me coverage that I could keep machines and sell and do the business what I want. So money was not a problem for me. I, I, and if, I ha if you had money in ghetto, you could obtain everything because it was smuggled in from luxuries, from, you know, but for very big money. And I was the lucky in the, on, the, on the time that I could afford it. <coughs> and Did of this course, position afford you any other um, privileges of living? Did you have things other people didn't have? I told you I had the privilege of living in an apartment for myself, but later on I saw that these privileges are going to and to be diminished because I found out that this was true that the ghetto was decreased and the apartment where we live became outside the ghetto. You understand? And then I made the change. I knew. Carl George Schulz, Schulz from before the war. The factory what he grabbed from the Jewish owners were my clients from before the war. I knew the factory like my ten finger. I, de I delivered the machines, I delivered the, the uh, equipment, everything. And I knew that Carl George uh, Schulz is, was a poor man with a small vision who cannot manage a factor of 2,000 people. And he knew me that I can do it. And I showed him a way how he can enrich himself to a point what is unbelievable. How, how did we do it? The factory need to get raw material to make clothing you need uh, wool or uh, yarn or the, in this came was one central place in the in Europe under the German army the Bekleidungsamt in Berlin who had all these in whomever they gave order orders they gave a permission to him to buy this on the on the official market he got orders to make underwear sacks, to, to, to make uh, uh, gloves, to make... So, so he got orders to buy the... Of course, they didn't... They tried to supervise that. They sent in uh, from Germany uh, textile engineers from Chemnitz, me, female and males, that they were supposed to be this. But he was the commissioner, he was the head of it. Of, he took in Poles as the, the because uh, you couldn't be uh, in a job of a supervisor or an executive. Uh, you could only be, be a physical uh, worker. And the salary was by the SS made up what these physical workers can be made, make. And Schulz has to pay the salaries to the SS. In the SS, for these salaries, delivered food, the meager thing for the money what the workers have obtained and they have collected. This was the, 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 the way this was done. When I got in, in Schulz saw, after a while, that I can do it, what I told him, because I saw that rules and laws and honesty is completely disappearing. I had my brother with me on the in the factory. My brother was more of an idealist than me. And he took pa the charge to give out needles, 
uh, spare parts and all those things. And we had German technicians over there from Lodge, uh, Germans from, from Czechoslovakia, from Sudeten, Deutschland. They have been the most cleverest in technicians. The, not the Germans from Germany, the Germans from Czechoslovakia, from Sudeten, you know what this is. And they wanted to, they saw that money, they wanted to, to make money, so they took from my brother needles and parts and took it out and sold it on the free market. So my brother used to go crazy. He says, I am not going to give them, they steal it. And I was in arguments with him, I told him, they steal from a, from a, uh, from a thief. Hitler stole that from Jews and from Poles from all over Europe. And they steal it from Hitler. What do you care? Common law says that you are all right if you steal from a, from a thief, you are not liable. Because this is the law what we had in the common law, that you cannot come for relief to a court unless you have clean hands. This is the Jewish law, this is the common law. If the other from whom you stole it, stole it, you are free. So I, I used to tell him, what do you care? And he, as I made friends, he made enemies, he couldn't give up that they are stealing it. And he, he was right, but I wanted them to steal. Which brother was this? The, my oldest brother. Abraham? Yeah. You, you, you understand this more what this is? I induced them to steal it especially induce them because I knew that this is the way that they will be dependent on me you and because I knew where to sell the raw material because was a world went on people needed a pair of socks people ne needed a coat and uh, if you uh, you had to know uh, need a uh, raw material to and this were poles who used to be in a small way before they have been looking for the raw materials in a thing a uh, kilo what used to cost if we got it from the official way two marks you could get from them 450 marks. You, you can understand the, the difference, uh, the difference what this is. This was three, 200 times more we paid for it. Where did you sell it? It was near the factory, it was an open market, like a whole. over there was the black market. So I knew people who are there. I didn't sell it, I didn't. Go. I only organized for them because it was too dangerous for me to go there to sell it. They used to bring, the, but how can you get it out from the factory? You have Germans, uh, the, uh, the, the Wehrmacht who are on, uh, uh, who, who are supervising, nothing should come out. The shops are German in everything. This was dangerous, and this had to be an organization. First of all, I made an organization of Poles, whom I knew that they are honest people. It was very difficult. And this Poles, whom I knew, was, uh, did not disappoint me, I have to admit. It was a small percentage. Secondly, I decided everybody makes money. Everybody was so much money that this is enough for ever money. For the commissioner, for his sellers, for the guys who sell. Who sell. If you got for it something what cost two zlotis, 450 zlotis, and you could send out two trucks, they brought the money back in valises. You understand? And the Jews wanted this money. Why? The Jews still co uh, had uh, diamonds and had all kinds of things what they have been hiding. But they wanted to go out from the ghetto and save themselves. So in order to go out, they needed some money with them to, to be able to pay off a policeman to buy food. So they glad there was nobody who wanted for, to buy from them the diamond because nobody needed it. So if somebody could bring and give them this money, what they want, you could get as much as you want. I bought for this German about 120 the most luxurious watches 
Защото цата има седем твифти ваче сонича. I bought for his girlfriend diamonds, what you can, mink cords, silk, the best. Jewish manufacturers covered up a little bit and they have been looking to go out from the ghetto to say everybody knows. So it was not difficult to get to this because everybody wanted to sell it because he couldn't take it with him. You, you understand? And here, this was the modus vivenda, how I live. Of course, if they brought the, back the money, I got the money. I gave it to, the, to them. So what did I do? I will tell you later. I w came, this, uh, the Germans sent in uh, textile engineers. So this was a, a woman, a textile engineer from Chemnitz, a very fine person, but she helped too on the actions uh, uh, to select Jews to the, the, the ideological, I was thinking, I talked to her. I talked to her like a, to, to, like a friend. She did not realize that she's doing something wrong by obeying the order, by bringing together a group of, Jew, of Jews and send them to She didn't realize. You understand me? But she did it. But because I was so convenient, for me, she do, did everything what she could. For instance, she was beautiful, and she used to have a very intimate relationship with the Schulz and with the assistant policyfier for the whole Warsaw district. Who was that? This girl. Who, who was wo the? Who worked in the factory. Who was the administrator? Yeah. So she, for me, went overnight and she brought me, a, a, from him, a permit to, to go out free from the ghetto back and forth. Who, wa who was this that she got the permit from? From the head of the Gestapo on the district of Warsaw. What she was, was very intimate with What him. was his name? I cannot remember. I cannot remember. remember. And she used to bring me over. Sometimes it was, for, was uh, not possible to bring for an individual, but for a group. What, so she used to bring me a permit for 10 people to take with me. So I was free always to go in and out from the ghetto. On the 120 people, on the 400,000 people got this permit. Because, and this was destined only from the people from the Judenrat who were in contact of the exchange, the food and all those, those thing, things. And I got a permit through this woman. What did you do with the other permits? The other permit, sometimes I took with me people, fr friends out. But this was so dangerous. If you go then out from this, the Poles used to, ha first of all, how, I, this is interesting for you, how could a Jew go out? It was walled up, you had only three uh, places who you call, co co smugglers used to smuggle in. So how did it happen? It so was like a new language, a jargon. On the entrances were Jewish police, Polish police, and Gestapo German police. The Jewish police what were assigned to this place were clever guys. And they right away on the post made the Germans and the Poles in a point that they wanted to make. Everything was, the, the atmosphere was so bad that this young, so a Jew wanted to go out, so he went to the Jewish policeman and he told, told him, I want to be out, this, I want to go on the Aryan side. So he told him it cost 5,000 slots. And this was a, they, they were afraid to say, so this was a jargon, how they said it. So you know a Jude Bax what this is. So they, um, so they told him the truth. So this Jewish police, policeman asked him, "Did Jude Bax will play?" 
for the youth bikes, bikes, you have to throw each money they should play. So he says, yes, the youth bikes will play. How much play I'm playing? So he told, 5,000, he told. If he says, yes, 5,000 playing, this and this, I will be on this point. From the 5,000 uh, uh, um, uh, slot, uh, slotis, the Jewish guy took 1,000 slots, and they divided with the four between themselves. The Polish guy took 2,000 uh, slots, and the Germans took 5,000 slots. And they let him out. He came in, in the jam, everybody knows that. He went out from this, it was a big danger. Why? The Poles knew that Jews want to go out from ghetto. So they stayed there, outside, to catch the guy. Because they knew if the guy goes out, he will have some money with him, new boots in the win winter time, good clothing, so they catched him and they took away from him. This was the most dangerous thing, I think. Because they put him uh, as he go, otherwise they will, uh, and they l let him always naked, uh, naked. So, so they killed the people what, what went out this way. And they became known in Polish as Schmalzowniks. What is Schmalz? Schmalz is fat that they are taking off the fat from the people. They leave, leave them born wise when they go out. This was the biggest horrible thing. They did not touch me. Why? Because they knew already that I go back and forth and I, am, and I have a permit that, they, that I am not afraid if they will call Jewish pol police or this. So I could go out when I, once I, Anya was sick, I went out even without that permit in the, to take her to the hospital. And they didn't stop me because they were used to my face to go out back and forth. It's very difficult for a person to understand this. And all this idea came to me by looking out through the window when they started to grab. I saw that I have to put my mind in a different... Uh, the Germans, what I knew, what I remembered, are not existing. Hitler has educated a new Germany, and this was the, the Germany what he educated. And I have to take advantage of it, and I did. I did took advantage of this, that I... The Polish underground knew already that I am the guy who can make money, whatever. That they got not enough money from, from England, from the uh, g Polish government. So they, to, to keep an underground, you need to do a lot of money. Money is a very important fact in this way. So they knew that the money man, I am. We're going to take a break now and resume in a minute. L now you understand already. You haven't got a... a, a uh, you haven't got an interview like this because few people This is tape number six, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19th, 1998. When I lived after my marriage on the Solna Street with Anya, we had a neighbor across the, the door. His name was Borenstein. He was a Jewish policeman. 
a strong, tall man, man, and he had a little boy about five years old and a sweet wife, and we became very close friends for, from living in the same building. One day, this policeman dis disappeared. He didn't come come back. He was his duty there on the Umschlagplatz where the uh, cattle uh, cars have been filled with Jews. And what has happened? The German officer who was in charge of sending out the transport hasn't got enough Jews to fill up. And he used to be very reprimanded if he sent anti cars because he wasted energy. So he took the policemen from the Umschlagplatz took away from them the head as policemen and put them in, in the cars and sent them to Treblinka with all of them. And nobody knows where, he, where they are, but what has happened. One day, after a few months, this guy is showing up. His house is already outside the ghetto. I didn't live there. His wife, he couldn't find to. What has happened? Because he was such a husky, strong man, in Treblinki he was assigned to a commando to take out the gold, the money from the packets what the people left before they went in to the crematorium, to the bed where they have the gas. And he, they, this commando has put the clothing in order and put it in bundles and the money and they loaded on cars to Berlin to send out. He was thinking about his child and about his, uh, his uh, wife. So one night when he has been loading it, he loaded himself into a car. In the middle of the car running, I suppose that the guy who has been uh, watching it was asleep, he jumped out from the car. This, this, this could be about 55 miles from Warsaw already, and by foot he walked in back to Warsaw. And somehow he was, uh, he knew the tricks because he was a policeman himself. He smuggled himself into the ghetto. For whom did he look for me? Because he has knew that I lived across his door till the last minute, so I must know what, the, what has happened to his wife and his child. And he found me, of course. He, if we talked, I knew that his ma wife is not alive, that she was already. Uh, she, she went with the transport to the same Tremblinki where he was. So in he gave me a living description of what is happening with all the transport in Treblinki. After this conversation with him, I decided under no circumstance will I go alive anywhere. If I have to go, I will go, they will, I will be already dead. What did he tell you about Treblinka? He told me how the transport came in, the train, how the people were hoarded out from the train, how they were moved to take off their clothes and put it in a bon bundle. From this bundle of uh, uh, or they put, they send them in for a bed, and this bath has already the, had already outlet of the cyclone gas what they let out, and they all were gassed to death. And from there they put them into the crematorium to burn the corpses. He told me how this was. What did you do with that information? I told it to my friends. My friends didn't want to believe. And the, 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 this is why I have, uh, I think that I influenced some people that they didn't go. One guy is now alive whom I helped to go out from the factory in Argentina, one is in Israel. But I was angry of Chernyakov that he knew about it, I suppose, I don't know. And he didn't make it public, he thought that by comp uh, cooperating, he will still be able to sell, save some people. Because the moment you knew this, you, uh, if you had some 
in a strength you des- you can what will you go you will go in a cattle car to be put in in a, a room with cyclone and be being burned burned this was my feeling from this moment on i knew that i will not go and i knew that my 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 mother was with me my sister in my i I didn't have the connection, what I t- told you, that I went to Schultz after all those things, and I got the connection with his girlfriend, who was the girlfriend of the... Pro- I was looking for it. So they were taken to Treblinka. My, my brother, this brother, the old one who was with me, the factor was with me, and my younger sister till the last minute. They after the the ghetto was closed after that a uh, Polak gave them out he they, he knew that they have money so he wanted to rob their money but i was so careful that they didn't know where i am because i saw that strong people honest people wanted, couldn't hold out the gestapo tortures and they gave out their closest people you tell yourself that you are a hero, that you would never do this, but this is not true. Tortures are making people do things what is unbelievable. And I got the hold of it, so I decided that even my brother and my sister will not know where I am. What happened to them? They were shot, I know where, in near the Judenrat, across the street where we lived there. I saw a Pole told me that what has happened after the war. Did you ever witness any of the deportations? Yeah, of course I, would, I, I witnessed. What was that like? This was a horrible thing. Uh, the, the Germans came into a district sent up the Jewish police to the apartment, knocked the doors, everybody down, everybody down, 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 down. Who has made a move downstairs on the courtyard? What was uh, dangerous, they shot on this spot. I have seen people sh- uh, sh- uh, shooting. And then they took him to the Umschlagplatz, they marched them, but what is it? In, in loaded in the cattle, uh, cart, and sent to Treblinki. This was the deportation. I saw it with my eyes not one time. One day they sent everybody to the Miller Street, and I went to the Miller, but then I was already in Schultz Factor, and I, so I right away go, went back in the next day, and I even went in again to take out somebody. But till I got this connection, what I told you, I was lame. And I saw with this connection that the only thing is what I have to do with it is prepare myself for the last minute. And what did I prepare? I built three apartment houses with a Paul who was a builder. And he was a commandant in the Polish underground. And the houses were built under, an, under the, a gentleman's agreement with them that I can use the places, the hiding places what was built in, in the houses. Four hiding places. We built two in, vo- in one building, in one in one. And one of the hiding places is existing now. And there is a sign on it what the, uh, after the war, the city government put that here has been uh, a Jewish family saved themselves. I have the photograph even from the inscription. You, you understand? And uh, this is a, uh, existing now. I am uh, going in, a, a, a woman lives there, I am supporting her because I wouldn't like, the Poles don't, I want that they should make from this a historical place to show for history if a Jew has survived, how he has survived. My mother died in with, with me and I have buried her on the Christian cemetery and the Poles wanted me to take it out to the Jewish cemetery, I wa- because 
for materialistic ways. They wanted the place because this cemetery is now the principal cemetery, and they get from a person who wants this place a million lotus. I refused, only because I wanted to show that a Jew, not only that he couldn't live as a Jew, but he couldn't die as a Jew. What was your wife Anya doing during all this time? My wife Anya, till I had to uh, to go out already, the same Schultz, I have to go by in the last moment, he gave me permits to stay to clean out the factories. But in the last moment, he got scared that if I will go to the camp, I will start talking and I know too much what he has done and how much money he has made. And he decided to kill me. And he had about 10 people like me what with whom he had special connections. So he killed most of them. One woman, one wife from one man is now, in, I'm in contact with her in, in Miami. And all of a sudden, a Paul, a director, what I told you, but I was not in such good relationship. He was always jealous of me because he knew that he cannot make a move if I don't accept it. Came, I don't know, this was something from, all, from the Almighty, and told me, listen, Jocelyn, you he, he decided to, to kill you. Move. He will be here in about 15 minutes. And I saw that he is serious. I had a hiding place in the factory. I can stay till tomorrow and tell, tell you what I did in this factory. So I went in the hiding place. And he came in and he looked for me. And he looked to a girl who was my a, a, an acquaintance and she worked with me because she knew that I knew her and she has with me a relationship. He looked for me, and I, uh, he couldn't find me, and I, this was the moment I went out. And Anya came to the place where I built this apartment house, where I had the hiding place. I went there in to go, but how did I go in? This is, this is something what is, because the atmosphere was so that if everybody looked you in, in your face, who you are, in uh, Poles recognized Jews, German not. So what did I do? I looked for that. As I, I had a Pole, a friend, he was married to a beautiful Polish girl. So I told myself, I called him up and I told him, Lila was her name. Listen, I have to borrow you Lila for a couple of hours. <laughs> Let her come here and here, elegant, dressed to the point. I took out my new suit over there and dressed myself in like two lovebirds. I, in the middle, I walked out with them. And they took the police, this, and they couldn't believe that two people like me are Jews now. And this how I went out. You, you understand? Where was, where was Anya all this time? Anya was all the time as a, on false paper as a, a Polish uh, Christian in, a, in certain places. What I find, found for her, paid a lot of money for uh, uh, the room. And in a, in a lot of places, uh, she was naive. She, uh, she did not... Uh, uh, know that she's surrounded with Jews and she thought that this is, uh, that these are Poles, no, or Germans. But uh, somehow she saw, and then she came right away. She knew where I have built the hiding places. And we got together on the Świętokrzysta Street on the hiding place. And I was sitting the first month, not doing nothing. I, I wanted that the 
burning ghetto should go down, the Germans march still in, they have uh, 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 demolished all the houses that were burned. And then I started still to make contacts with people in order to go on. And I, I had over there already my uh, radio equipment, my uh, cocktail, because live I would never go. This was the, I had enough equipment to demolish the whole building in, in this moment. I had a revolver and I have everything because the underground made use of it too. With me, this was my arrangement. Did you leave the ghetto prior to the uprising? When did you get in out? In the uprising. The factory, what we had, through my connection, got a permit to make a branch right outside the ghetto. And this night, I asked Anya to come to the other factory. I had over there a little apartment. I was, I had everything. I had all, in. I was there with a group of workers. What I took out from the main factory to the satellite factory. And I am in the over there, the overnight. In the morning, five o'clock in the morning, somebody hollers, Yo, Susan, Yo, Susan. Schultz came. And he asked me to, I just was in, in my shade, I run down, and he tells me, I have an order. We are finished. We cannot anymore function in Warsaw. We have to move the factory to Travniki near. Uh, near Lublin, this is near um, this camp, what I actually come back. I, I, I got 22 permissions for people to stay with me to uh, dismount the machinery and to load it up and to take to, to Tarniki. So he asked me, what do you need for your family? So I told him I need my brother my sister and my mother, and I need for me, I need four. So he counted, one, two, three, gave me four points. So my mother was over there, and I took her out to the satellite factory. I went with cars back and for, forth with the, to uh, dismount the, the factory, and we sent it to Travniki. To Travniki. Some friend of mine came through. It was right away a business. The Germans took money from Jews to get them um, among the clothes and among the machinery out from the ghetto. Some people. So, so conditions what are no, not to describe it even. I cannot to describe it to you, to you. And I saw what is going out in the ghetto is burning. I never fought in the in the ghetto. I saw what is going out. I helped them. If they needed to bring in uh, 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 materials, I could bring it in there. They knew that I can, that I, they can rely that this is going to be. Because I had a party from the satellite people of uh, 100 people going country. I gave each one a little part. And we, I came in inside. I put it together. This, uh, for oh. instance, this was, this was special names for a revolver was called in this time, it was a jargon, a chimney. You understand? A Jew was called a Turk because they didn't want to see, see Jews have, have been. Turks have been there. So this was created a language of a jargon for the ghetto. What were you bringing from the outside into the ghetto? Nothing. What were you for only sometimes equipment for the underground. That's all. That's all. And who uh, gave it to you on the outside? Uh, Poles, they used to have people who bought it for them, who took fortunes of money. Which group of the underground the, did you give it to? The underground was there in the place where was the Zionist uh, uh, Irgun group. 
But the biggest part were the socialists in the Rab, the Bund. It was not so big as they historically uh, presented. It was a very difficult fight and they had very poor equipment. No help from the Polish Amber. What were you able to see or learn about the uprising from the other side? I was see, did uh, could see the the fires what are going on in the in the ghetto. Could you hear anything? No. Couldn't hear. The only thing I have heard remarks what were terrible from Paul's. What remarks let them burn up the Jews over them with the mice and with the insects what they have. How long did you stay in Warsaw on the Aryan side? I stayed in Warsaw on the Aryan side, side, side till the end of the Polish underground. I was taken out from Warsaw with Anya when they took out all the, uh, for the Polish underground for, from the home army. And the home army wanted to kill me the same because they, they, it's, uh, the, the, the home army had a difficult, had different uh, the, uh, detachment. Some have been neutral, then some have been so anti-Semitic that they have killed the Jews during the up Polish uprising. And, and one of the detachments went after. How did you escape them? Very interesting thing. You, you, you know that if you are used to some something, your ear is getting attuned to it. For instance, I am very attuned to anti-Semitism because I was exposed to it very much. I was to, exposed to being underground and to hiding and to listen. I have a nature when I am now in a group of people. I listen from four sides. I listen straight. I listen on this side. I listen on this side because this I developed for my life during the underground. I saw, I knew that the underground had a right wing group what goes after Jews. And I saw one guy of them, when he saw me coming out, when you come out after so many hour, uh, months from hiding places, you look like a wild person, pale. You cannot walk good because I didn't wear shoes, because I was afraid that somebody will listen when I walk. You understand? So he or uh, right away smelled out that I am a Jew, that I had to go out for my underground. And I right away was suspicious looking at the world. And he let know this group is right group that here is a guy like me. And I observed them and they observed me. And I I knew already that in another district they uh, they shot a Jew. So I observed them and I saw that they uh, directly go after me. I made in the course of the underground friends with a Polish lawyer what was before the war, the attorney general of in Poland, in, in Poznan. Very intelligent guy, very fine guy. And we made jokes, we got very friend friends. And he saw too that they are going after me. So under his pushing me, he, I, I agreed to do something, what he has advised me to do. He advised me to do, 
to go with him to the co commandant of the underground for this uh, uh, part of Warsaw. His name was, uh, uh, he was a colonel Ridwan in those times. And we went up to his office with him and he told me I should let him introduce me in this. I let him go. So he told me, told him so. You know, Pulkovnik Ridwan, that you have a chance to go under a military court, Polovic, this is a court what is adjudicating you for to death. Because under your direction now, people who survived this are being shot, are being looked for. And you know, he says, if the, if the Polish government from Lublin, because will come in, you are going on this uh, court, and if they will come in from London, because under your direction, these people, uh, and you are responsible, I will see to it that you will go under the court. Program. This uh, colonel changed his outlook right away. So he says, I don't, this is not my order. So he said, it's not your order, please. I want uh, in writing that you are against shooting now people who survived and people who will do this will go under a military court. So he says, I am from London forbidden to give anything in writing, but I give you my officer's word of honor that this man is not going to be done anything I will see to it but in writing I cannot give it and he kept his word I saw the next day that his group would look from is, uh, is out how long did you remain in Warsaw after that uh, about uh, 10 days and then they took us to Germany and with Anya and we went to a uh, to a camp on a uh, in a place where they had a, a distribution camp to Germany and they divided men and women Anya was in a women companion but in me I took again a chance I jumped out from this in in the men's companion I was I saw that I am in bad shape because I was a, an officer came also to the four where I was we were in four mass that who is a Jew in this uh, in this four I was lucky that the other people didn't understand what this Gestapo want so he said that they knew uh, from circumstance, they can recognize Jews from circumcision. Poles have not been circumcised. So he says, you should all open your slacks in in, in a show if you are circumcised. So they didn't understand what he wants. I did, did understand what he wants. So I the first went down. In a, so he said, not, not, not you should do it. They should do it in this house. I told you this was... That, that in my survival, I can only uh, show on, uh, on, on God's uh, destiny that I... We're going to take a break now.
This is tape number seven, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19th, 1998. We were mad. The Germans came back into Warsaw. The Poles in the, up, uh, uh, in the uprising kept uh, the part of Warsaw only for about 10 days, two weeks. The Russians stayed on the other side of the Vistula, invaded only that, the, that the, the Germans should kill them out, the Poles, and then they will march them, they let them stay, and the Germans took out the, the underground Polish army to, from Warsaw to a railroad depot, and sent them to Germany in March, the, uh, in, in trains, and, and they marched me and my wife in the trains. And uh, uh, the, I, uh, I, I, I went from the men's party into the women's party, as I told you, and we were going to Germany. As we were going to Germany you know, on one more small station, some girls from the Red Cross came with water. They knew that nobody had water for days. So I got some water from a girl from the Red Cross like, and I started to talk to her. So I asked her if this is a chance to get lost from here. So this girl encouraged me. She says, why, definitely you should do it. You know where you go, you go to Germany, you go right away to, to, to a camp you got. Her. So she encouraged me so. I saw a German sitting with a, uh, with a rifle, an old man, that I jumped out from the, from the train down. And I saw that he is not reacting. When I saw him not reacting, I took Anya for his hand and I pulled her out. I was already to this point that I told her if she is not going to jump after me, that she should leave a note for me if she will survive on my mother's grave. You understand? And then, like fools, we went both down under a bench on this little station. Now, empty, I know this was already twilight, seven o'clock becomes uh, the curfew. Uh, the German patrols have been mainly on the railroad station because the Stalingrad was already under, uh, in those time and Stalingrad fall not that they haven't got equipment fall because they haven't got the oil for for the and so this is why they have watched so the the stations and I knew here so I say come let's go and we started to go to to farmers around the they should let us stay overnight. And we went to three farmers and they recognized that we are Jews. And they didn't let me stay overnight over there. To the fort I already went in under the straw and they said, didn't ask him. And we stood there and, and I was scared like hell because the dogs started to bark. And I, here I see that with the kerosene lamps, they go out the farmers to see what is happening. But then, a, a miracle, they didn't find us. And they went in, everything got quiet, and in the morning we walked out. And so I walked out, I started to, to take my memory in, where I should go. I knew in this direction I had a customer, a Paul, and I knew that he was a, a, a honest man. So I say, let's walk to him. And we walked to him. And we walked, we walked, and we had that, he had a terrible thing. His son was in the underground, and he was receiving from England the packages what the underground army received. But near, here, there, near this little town, they made a, a hidden little a uh, place to to throw it down into uh, land for for small planes, and they called him and they shot him, the, his son. So here I come into his house. His son was shot several. He was scared like hell, but he let us stay overnight. 
in the morning he said that a woman who brings milk from a little village further that maybe she will know. So she came and I started, she didn't know, but I didn't let her out. We went after her to a very a village in a country what you didn't see anybody. And over there I caught a farmer. A farmer what couldn't read and write, but he was intelligent. I had false paper, Anya had false paper, I have a different paper. He let me stay with him. He let me stay with him and we stayed in this place till the Zhukov's army had marched into Poland. So they marched through this village and they took quarters for in this village and in this village this farmer I don't can I don't want to tell you s stories about this. In this village I did I found two a business. I started to with the son of the son, son make vodka. <laughs> and I saw because I saw that the that the farmers go someday to the bigger town buying vodka. So I told them, I knew that this man whom I know is making the vodka that they buy. So I bought from him uh, uh, this raw al alcohol and I made with him the vodka and salt. And they didn't know what to do. All of a sudden they, they, they became rich people. And then I got another thing. The Germans used to ask the farmers to give out a tax, but the tax was in money or in points. Let's say a cow was 120 points, a horse was 100 points, a chicken was 20 points. So each month the farmer had to give it away. This was a way to figure out, to give them the, the, the amount of points what they want for half the money. If you sold the cow and bought chicken, you could buy chicken cheaper. So I started to count them out how to give this, and I became a specialist in this. And I, I got whatever I want for to make this for, for each one ever a month. In this, oh, I survived, survived. Who liberated you? The Russians, they, they, they liberated me over there, and the next day I was so impatient I wanted to go back for, to Warsaw. And this was the 4th or the 5th of January, when the, the war, war went on. I saw that the Russians are two thieves. The first thing I wanted to congratulate him, that he came in, he wanted to take away from me my watch. The, for, uh, a motorized division. And I was so foolish that I didn't give him. <laughs> he could sh shoot me, they told me. Well, I didn't give him. I, th I told him, listen, you are a liberator, so you want my watch? Go to the Germans and take yourself their watch. I went in to, I wanted to go back to Warsaw to see what is happening. So how could I go to Warsaw? Nothing, the, the, the uh, army is walking. So in the uh, village, the artillery headquarters from the division made a point in a Jewish colonel was the head of the artillery. So I went to him, he spoke a little Ru Jewish, a little Russian, and I told him I want to go to Warsaw. So he told me that on Tomaszów they cleaned the way that I can go. On Skrniewice, for instance, said, we have a lot of maruders, don't take a chance. I borrowed from somebody a bicycle and I went into Warsaw. It was winter, I was the only single person in whole Warsaw. You know what this is and this is winter. And I went to the places where I had friends whom I, who have been hidden in selling for me needles and parts and I, and I saw that they are not in but they had the, the, even burned up, they didn't steal from me, they had the, play, the things in their apartments. You, I, I came across Pauls, I tell you, two who have been very honest. I was a lucky person to, to, a, to a degree. I say that the Almighty God wanted a witness, so he 
picked me as the witness and he and he was on the on me to save me to go through this dangerous thing what a human being could go in through on his own what happened after your return to Warsaw was was Anya with you no I left Anya when did she return I left her and I went to Warsaw look for the buildings what I built and for the one building has survived and the Germans have been there and the Russians have been there but later they couldn't find this was so ingeniously made the bunker and the hiding place because when we build the building we build each floor in a different layout that you couldn't know that something is existing and I have and this was so when, you, when I was inside I closed myself up and nobody could knew that something is 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 in there. So I went up and I found in my hiding place. I found inside is still my revolver and my food and everything. I have it was winter. I closed up the the windows with some uh, 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 wood and I went around in the empty. Uh, houses and I found some uh, down uh, covers and I went to sleep. The next day I wanted to go on the, uh, on the other side to on the, where you were still, where the Russians have been staying about two months over there was life. So I, no bridges, fax holes with Germans and in the foxholes, you see frozen Germans in the foxholes. So I hold, held myself by a frozen foot from a German uh, soldier, and I jumped down on the ice of the Vistula and walked through on the other side to Praga, and I went out. I went out, they didn't see anybody. So the Polish uh, police kept me that I am a, a spy. And they took me on the on, on their headquarters, and they kept me over there. They, and I, it is a whole story. And I, I couldn't. They took my passport, my my full passport, and they finally, uh, uh, I saw that I cannot get out from them, so I run away from them. Where did you go? I went to the city and started to look for people that I know. I, I found somebody and I, I rented a room for myself. I, I washed myself. I went back and I looked for some clothing and I made myself say, self looking de decent. And I started to look right away to make a book to write somehow to in, and after a, while, uh, after a week, ten days, I went back and I took Anya back with me to Warsaw, to the place I arranged it. And I stayed in this place till from January till about April. And then we, uh, we decided to go out from Poland. And we went first to Czechoslovakia, we went to Hungary, then to Romania. I wanted to go to Romania, to I Israel, I couldn't go. Then I went back and I went to Germany and we stayed in Germany in Munich for about a year, I think, about not a short of a year, and I went to the United States. But in, I was already all right in, in, in a, a, after two or three months, I made my first $10,000 and I moved into a ho hotel in a, in a, and I lived good. Before you moved to Germany, did you ever meet other survivors who had returned from any place else? Yes. In Warsaw, when I got out from this Urzand uh, Bezpieczeństwa, uh, uh, from the Polish police, spy police, and so the next day I like a, like a fool, I went back 
And I tell him, what is this you have arrested me after so much thing? You keep me a day here and not calling me. I went away. What is it? What? So he says, we send out special letters to, 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 to get you. You are a spy. You are the so I told him, you are crazy. What are you two talking? He said, I, uh, I was uh, hiding as a Jew. I was the whole so the guy who was on the duty was a Jewish uh, co uh, lieutenant. So after a while, he started to. So he told me that there is a place where the Jew, Jews who come back are getting together in Praga. And he took a jeep and he took me there. And over there, I met some people. It was a dangerous place. After a while, I stopped going there because people came in who have been hiding and surviving in the forest. A person who was in the forest so came back, he looked like a beast. And I saw that this is dangerous, that over there, if they came people from camp, and if somebody came from a camp and another guy said that he was a capo, they didn't wait, they killed him on the spot. So I was afraid to go in after a while. This was something what is unbelievable to describe. You you understand? But over there, later on in this uh, place, I made met a Jewish Russian colonel, Mirkin was his name, with whom I befri whom I befriended, who did for me a lot of things. He, he helped me take back from Paul's set uh, merchandise what I had. And then later on, he wanted to take off the uniform and go with me to Germany. It was a time, it was a time, it was a time. But in Germany, I was already all right. In Germany, I had a little business already, and I had an apartment, and I lived in a, in a uh, new Freiman where this was private houses to and I started to make money, and I did, but I didn't want to stay there, and I came to the United States. In the United States, this is what I was told, wanted to ta tell you. Was there ever any thought of trying to reach Palestine? Yeah. I went to even to the Black Sea port, but a month before me, they stopped all connections to, from uh, with the Russians to Palestine. And I decided to go to Palestine or to the United States. But to Palestine with the Aliyah bet I didn't want to go. To, because they took the people to the island and they camp again. I told myself, no, no more. If, whatever, if I will get a visa to the United States, I go to the United States. And I got in Munich uh, a visa to the United States and I came here. I was very successful here in, my, in, in those times. Did you come to the United States by boat? Yeah. Do you remember the name of the boat? Marina Perch. And where did it land in New York? In, in the pier here in, in mid Manhattan. I have seen in the morning the skylight of Manhattan and I have been sitting and meditating. Who knows me the, here? To whom will I talk? How will I start? And what in this is a world of normality? And what is going to be with me? How will I fit in? This was my thought. What were your first impressions of the United so States? With, uh, so my impression that I have come to a colossal thing. And I went out from the boat. On the pier, they put the bundles what somebody had according the names. So the inste instead, Jolson, instead of J, they put on Y Jolson here, and I couldn't find my <laughs> my bundles. And uh, the United Service for New American had some people on the pier what greeted the people. So I was greeted by a young g girl by the name Parker, who spoke a little Jewish, who was sweet. And this girl took such interest in us that this is unbelievable. 
First of all, she wanted to take Anya and to buy her clothing to do things. And she thought, Anya thought that she's considering her as a poor per person and she wants to give her peace. So she started to cry. And this girl <laughs> wants to do something good, you understand? And finally, the next day, she asked us to register to come to, the, to their offices, and she was already waiting for me. And they gave us some money for, for a living. They gave every survivor who came. And they gave me a room in the Hotel Marseille on the Broadway in 120th Street. But after two days, they told me that the room has to be emptied because you were people and they wanted me to go to Los Angeles. I thought that Los Angeles is a far away and I made them my dreams that I will be in New York. So I refused, I am a stubborn person. And they came, I should go to, to a point that they wanted to send me and she should stay here. I should see with her and buy me a ticket to go there. And I refused. I went out and I told myself, people are dying. If people are dying, apartments are emptying. I have to find a dead pe person in where an empty apartment is. I knew that in a good, pe a good neighborhood will be Americans what will find the apartment before me who can communicate. The times were bad that GIs came from the war without having the, no building was. So I went to the East Bronx, somebody, somebody told me that this is a poor neighborhood if uh, Jews uh, have been uh, living. So I went out in, in the East Bronx, went to every candy store. Whoever spoke Jewish, I stopped him on the street and I told him. And this way I found a woman whose husband died and she had an apartment on a six walk, uh, floor walk up. For me, this looks like a palace. I paid her a few dollars, what I have for a broken bed and a broken teeth, and I moved in. And I lived there for six months, eight, 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 eight months. And over there, I started to make already money. And over there, I already find the store, what I opened that up. What kind of store? In my, in my line, I saw, I used to ta take, uh, I make, uh, I right away, in those time, somebody offered me a job and wanted to pay me $160 a week. This was a lot of money. I have been making in those time $50, $60 a week. I started to go to factories, look, for you sewing machines, for repairs for sewing machines. And I, I found certain way myself and I made right away money. Finally, I saw that this is not for me a job, I can not, uh, not to uh, look at it enough. Because if I have to look, I, look uh, I started to put in ads in a paper for the garment industry that I am looking for certain things. I had a cousin, I gave his telephone number, and I got leads, and I started to be, to have leads that the American people in the business, if they needed something, they didn't have, they were not intelligent people in the business. I have to tell you that this was easy, because they have been so poor business people, they did not understand that I, with my refugee terror was far more advanced. If they needed something after three months, from, they came to me if I know maybe where they can get it. Because if I had leads and I went out and I couldn't buy it because I felt it too, I made a note of it. And if he came to me, you know, I had a note where this is. And if he needed, he could pay more. You understand? And I started to make money this way. And then I have... Uh, I always looked for big things. I saw that this is uh, to get a sewing machine was here impossible because the government has forbidden to manufacture family sewing machines during the war. They could only make on on special permission uh, industrial machines for the army. 
I found my way how I can get the machines, and I made the right away money. Because you see, it was a black market here. I, as a new person, what I knew, of, I didn't know of an OPA. I didn't know you want so much. Okay, I can find a person who will pay me more. I made a profit. I don't care. For, I didn't know that, that this is an OPA here. You you understand? So I got a guy in in Europe who ordered for me needles. Nobody wanted to offer me him because he couldn't get him an offer on the official price, sixteen dollars. He had to pay on the black market here twenty four. I could pay twenty four. I offered him forty. But if he got only one offer for forty, he gave me the order. You you understand what this is? So this was a golden land for me. What was the biggest adjustment for you coming to the United States? The biggest adjustment for me it was going too fast. Especially here I lived on the East Bronx and the, here I moved right away to the to Forest Hills. Here I moved out from Forest Hills from an apartment and I bought a house. Here I am in the house and I bought an estate in Kings Point with uh, two and a half uh, acres on the on the sound with 16, ro 16 rooms and a, a, a servants quarter quarter I was going too fast I somehow tried to adjust myself but my wife I keep the poop so couldn't adjust herself so fast to the new li life here I didn't like uh, already she was afraid I uh, moved out and I moved on the 5th Avenue I didn't want to go to the Park Avenue because there wasn't enough greens for me I moved too fast then I started to manufacture in, in Italy I was the only one in the world who manufactured sewing machines then, then. Uh, I was mm, mm, given uh, money for machines in here a year in advance I built a factory in Italy. I got the Stella de Repubblica Italiana from the... I was the first to bring industry to Italy. What was the name of your company? In the, in the beginning, Necky Song Machines. Yeah. I got publicity. This is what I want to, to, to tell you. Unwantedly, I got, I, I, I got a great advantage that I am a survivor. I went to the uh, United Jewish Appeal and told them, uh, uh, no, finally, this, this, this little girl, this Miss Parker said, told to me, you are not a guy for a job, you have to go on business for us, and we have a way that we will lend you money to go on business. And she slapped me to a guy over there, and with, he was a fool. Finally, when I had already orders in this, he lent me two thousand dollars. This guy, in the, but after two months, I made ten thousand dollars. I made, I had a lot of money, so I told myself, what am I going to hold there, two thousand dollars? I went back to them to give him back the two thousand dollars, and I wanted to give him a donation, two thousand dollars, that he shouldn't much a new person who comes to him for money, he should give him the two thousand dollars if he can go on business. When this guy saw this, he was flabbergasted. We're going to change tapes and resume in a moment.
This is tape number eight, interview with Leon Jolson, March 19th, 1998. There was something that you wanted to add to your story? I think that an interesting thing is that after I stayed uh, in Warsaw a few weeks, a friend of mine who was incarcerated in Auschwitz came to Warsaw. Uh, I went to school to Heider actually with his brother together and he was in the same school and uh, we were friendly uh, before the war. Uh, he somehow found out that I am in Warsaw and he ran to me and he wanted to me see me and I wanted to see him. Him. And he told me about his experiences in Auschwitz. I was wondering how he lived through in Auschwitz in his, in, in, in uh, uh, more or less in, in good health. Uh, so we started to talk. So the story is as follows. In Auschwitz they needed services in order to keep the, the place going. They needed a cook, and they needed a technician. And a friend of his with whom he was in charge of the water, the uh, water uh, uh, piping, cleaning uh, to, for the whole camp, because he was uh, specialized in this, uh, in this uh, uh, trade. And the Germans wanted a guy, they were afraid for sicknesses and for uh, epidemics. So they let him stay and work on the uh, water installation, you know, on the chemical cleaning it. And he had, they gave him a permission to take 40 people with him to, to manage it. And this friend of mine was one of the 40 people. And he told me that this man who took place or took care of it is still in Auschwitz and the Russians when they came in made him the civilian commander of the camp he should take care that the survivors who survived should be should have place for, for something to eat or uh, to sleep I was always I, after finding out what kind terrible place Auschwitz was I was interested that to see what out the street really is. So we decided to go with him back to Auschwitz because the same time we could get documents because the in, in Auschwitz in the camp the the Red Cross you know, gave people documents to return home. For instance, if in Auschwitz was a Jew from Kosice from uh, uh, Slovakia. He got a document that he uh, came to Auschwitz and to in, uh, uh, for, from Kochice and they recommend to all government uh, to help him go back home. And I wanted a document like this to go out from Poland, to, be, to go to uh, Germany or to Romania, to go to Israel. So we went both to Auschwitz and we stayed with this friend, he happened to be, his name was Knoll, Jakur Knoll. And we, he was a f very fine, pleasant guy, and he lost his family. He got, he befriended a woman who had uh, two children in Engele, had made on her the experiment, so, and he married this, uh, this woman. So in Auschwitz, I have seen the horrors after the war. The, the Auschwitz looked like the same day Germans would walk out. This was already a month or two, but still you could touch the ovens and you feel, felt a warm on your hand. <coughs> you could see the mountains of the children's shoes around, laying around. around. What they do, they had the same, uh, the, the same rule what they did in, in uh, Treblinki, that asked the people to undress and go in for a bed and from the bed to the, 
to the uh, to the crematoria. But in Birkenau, what is the next little place, they kept people young and strong working in uh, some way. I don't know exactly how this was the rule in Birkenau because I, lo I looked of it only from a distance uh, because I spent a few days in Auschwitz in the camp alone. I saw in Auschwitz too mountains of Hungarian money, of pengos, what people emptied out from there. And then I went to, to Budapest, I saw the same pengos being used as a currency to, uh, to, to buy things. Can you describe anything else that you found in Auschwitz? was enough to see because to describe this what was over there is so difficult the horror the people on the selections the older people the from the stories what I heard of being there of uh, 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 marching the women in the snow, naked out before they were let into the camp. This was horror of a horror. I haven't been in, I've, I have been lucky not to be in Auschwitz. Were so there any survivors there? There were survivors. There were survivors, people whom the Germans used for certain function, what they had to have in order to run the camps. And young people, especially in, in Birkenau, I saw survivors, but small groups of survivors. No, not, no. this was a, a, a very small group. It was horror and horror, I have seen it. But for me, was it interesting before I, I left uh, Poland to see what this main machine of killing looked like. This was the main, a killing machine. Have you ever returned to Poland? Yes. When did you do that? I have to return to Poland several times. One time I returned I have to tell you a story about this, I'm afraid. Because when I left Poland, I still had some family things, what I, some uh, gold uh, coins, some uh, uh, diamond rings, some this, but I was, <coughs> afraid to take it with me because borders and the police and all those things. So what I have done in the apartment building where I had my hiding place was on the courtyard, a little garden. So I went down and I uh, made a, a hole in the soil in this little garden and I covered this up with paper, with materials, and I put, and I have put it, left it over there. I was very anxious to get this back. So one day I decided, I was, a friend of mine told me that the Russian uh, or colonel is going to Warsaw with a, uh, with a truck and he can take some people with him. So I paid him and he took me to Warsaw. Some, I took the same time some sewing machine, some office machine, because I knew that this is already a shortage over there of, of it. And I took it and I have uh, sold it good when I came there. Finally, finally, I decided I went down to find my what I put in the soil over there. But in, during the day, I couldn't do it. I was afraid. So I it was cold in the middle of the night. I, I took a hake, 
and I was looking for it, engraving for a half a night, and I couldn't find it. In the moment I have already made up my mind that I am not going to go, I decided to look in one more place and I found everything, the way how I, how I left it. I found everything and I wanted to go back, so I was, well, Anya was, I left Anya in Hungary. Anya was left, so how did I take it? So I took Russian uh, coins and American coins and I saw it in, in, my, uh, in my jacket, in my coat and all those things. I wasn't careful already. I knew how to smuggle myself through an border, but I was so anxious to go home to, to where, I, where Anya was that I, I went too fast and I didn't get and they called me, called me and started to cut on me my suit and my t uh, thing and find everything and took it away from me and put me in a jail in Kosice in Slovakia. I stayed in this jail and the, finally they came to me, I should sign for them a paper that I agreed that this should be taken to me, they will let me out, and I was stubborn. I didn't want to do it. So they kept me there, they kept me there. Then another three days, finally I saw when they took me out to exercise in the morning that I am falling, so I agreed to sign the paper. I went to, to, to the Jewish community, which was a shul over there, and the, the, the reverend gave me a piece of bread. I remember till this moment the taste of it. And the president from the community lent me some money to buy a ticket to go to, to back to Budapest. I came to Budapest destroyed. The thing what I took with me, I had somebody, I made a in a business in Budapest, a partner. I was afraid that he should not uh, suspect that I took the money I sold her for myself. So in the cell, what I have been sitting, they used, they made some little names on the door, who's inside. When I walked out, I took this little name of mine, what was of the door, to show him that I was arrested, that I was in the, in the cell. After being in Budapest a month, I was so angry, I went back to, uh, to um, Slovakia. And I started to look in Slovakia for a connection to make it short. I found somebody, a lawyer, a Jew, who took my case pro bono. And we, get, we went to court and he has made a tremendous uh, presentation. That how I didn't know they were the complaint was that I don't uh, on the border that I didn't fill out the form that I have this with me because you were to supposed to fill out so the truth is he told them I was a, a, per, a person out from this kind of a, a situation how could I could they uh, they gave me back everything again. And I went back to Hungary, and in Hungary I was a while, then I told you I went to Romania, and I looked for a way to go to Israel, I couldn't go to Israel. Then I went to Germany. In Germany I went to in, in a little business and I was successful. I wanted to go to the United States. And in the United States I told you I the, the United Jewish, uh, the United Service for New America lent me $2,000 to go on business. This, we, this is the place where we stopped. And finally, I took the $2,000 back to them and, g and wanted to give him a donation for $2,000. The, the guy was so overwhelmed that he didn't want to take from me the money. And he told me to come back in a day. He told me how to return it. What did it, what did it show up? 
that they wanted to make big publicity, that they have helped a refugee going in business, and he not only he returned the money, I was the first person who returned money to them, but they lended somebody. When you were living in Sands Point, yeah. well, when you were living in Forest Hills and then Sands Point, did you and your wife um, reconnect with the synagogue and any Jewish life? We reconnect right away everywhere with every Jewish life. I was well received in Forest Hills in the synagogue. The rabbi was over there and it said this was a conservative synagogue. Uh, ben Zion Baxter, a wonderful person. A person what can be exemplary as an honest and good meaning person. He passed away. And in, in, in uh, Kings Point, I was well received. In a while, I was on the board of the synagogue and I was received in the synagogue. To be frank with you, I have reconnect with the people better than the Anya has. And this was my, what my mistake because she was somehow not so happy there. Did your experiences during the Holocaust affect your religious faith in any way when you arrived in the United States? Yes. In what way? In meditation, I have been thinking the good things what happened to me, I have to be thankful for it, and I don't know why and where and for, for what. But I couldn't reconcile the bad thing was, was happened to so many people that somehow if the Almighty could do good things, he was was easy for him to do uh, for, for him to do more good things for so many people. This was the the thought was bothering me. But you know, the Jewish faith says that you shouldn't ask clothes cautious. This means uh, you shouldn't ask you shouldn't question the move, moving of the Almighty, because you haven't got the lenses to see as far as he sees. As long as you haven't got the lenses to see, you cannot go in and question him what he saw. Do you understand? And I have reconciled myself, maybe willingly, by looking of a, a way to, to answer myself. What wasn't a hundred percent answer, what I have consoled myself with. How have you personally chosen to commemorate the Holocaust? I personally have chosen to commemorate the Holocaust through a, through, through a, a process of thinking. I wanted to put a gravestone for my family. Well, my brothers, my sisters, my nephews. So where can you put in a gravestone? In Treblinka, in this. So finally I decided to put a gravestone in Jerusalem, in Yad Vashem. And this came the idea to me to put up in Jerusalem the Warsaw Ghetto Plaza. And knowing that uh, Rappaport was the creator of the, uh, of the monument in Warsaw, I reconnected with him. And the condition between uh, the Jewish state and the Poles were very bad in those times. Uh, they have fired all the Jews from the position in the government. The Swedes have all invited them in those time. time. It's a terrible anti-Semitism has under this communist government uh, uh, came out. 
So the government in Israel wanted the main monument, what stays in Warsaw, should not go. They were afraid that they will destroy it. The waxes from what this monument was made were in, Paris, in France because Poland had no foundry who could make a big, make a big thing. So they sent it to Paris for uh, to, to a foundry to make it. And, but they didn't ba take back the waxes to Poland they, they, because a, a monument, a sculptor has phases. First, he makes something like this by hand, what you have, what you see here. Then, with a pantograph, he enlarges a set in, in, in wax to the size what this is, the monument has to be. Then, he re re they retouch the waxes, the noses and the faces. After the waxes are retouched completely, they put it in forms and put in the hot metal. So this is burning up the wax and a metal thing come, comes in from this form. Then they retouch the, the metal thing by hand. Uh, 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 Rappaport had about 10 assistants working with him to retouch every figure. figure. And after this is retouched, they cut it in pieces, and they are re-casting uh, it, and then they weld it in together again, and this is oxidized, and this is how a monument in, in, in is being created. And I got very friendly with him because I was... I not only financed it, but I was working with him on this. And I decided to do it in Jerusalem. And I was there. The first monument what was made about the Warsaw Ghetto in Jerusalem, I made in, in Yad Vashem. What is the name of the monument? The Warsaw Ghetto Plaza. And the monument has faces. The uprising and they saw Danielevich with the heroes they show you how they went in the uprising the last walk they they present the Jews walking to the crema crematoriums and then they show the new army in Israel and this is a plaza this is the water plaza. and this is the main place where all the the things what happen every year is made in Yad Vashem. This is why I felt that the place for a monument for a, is Jerusalem, because Jerusalem will always be there. Jerusalem was, was destroyed 3,000 years ago. Jerusalem came back. I don't know what is going to be with the monument, with the, uh, with the Washington Museum. As you have explained me about the memory, I feel too, but I feel that some anti-Semites go out in with a feeling that they are happy that this happened to the Jews. So for me, this thinking was a major thing that I felt, that Jerusalem is the place where the memory should stay forever and ever. What was it about Nathan Rappaport's work that spoke to you? Nathan Rappaport was a person who had a tremendous inner feeling with a sense of vision of things. He has seen this monument when he was in Russia. He was very, very well received in Moscow. They gave him the uh, Stalinist uh, uh, a big place with a studio with material because they have great respect for art. They had great respect for art. And, uh, and uh, um, 
uh, Rappaport in, in making for them sculptures have been thinking about his family and his parents in Warsaw. And he memorized this, uh, this uh, uh, monument. And he came to Warsaw. He just right away went and don't made them in sketches. He made the boxes right away. How have you chosen to commemorate the Holocaust here in New York City? Here in New York City, I have chosen my way to memorize it. I wanted children should remember it. And the school on the Park Avenue in 87th Street, when it was created, I have proposed to them that they should let me make, through Rappaport, a sculpture to show Korczak. Korczak was a children's psychiatrist who took 200 children in Warsaw Ghetto and put them and took care of them and went with them to, to Treblinki in spite that a German doctor wanted him to stay because he had such a tremendous worldwide name. He was the only children's uh, uh, psychiatrist with a statue what was known in the end of time. And he decided not to stay. He decided to go with his children. It's a whole story. He has prepared the children a day before how what will be in order mentally to help them to go through this. So I made this on the uh, commemor comm his commemoration and the return on the school. I decided this way to satisfy myself here. I went back to Warsaw to make, to change my mother's gravestone, who, who, who was buried as a Christian, to make it Jewish. I had a, I have a problem now. They destroyed it, the anti-Semites in Poland. I have to go. I am making my time now to go back to repair this. Why did you want to tell your story? I didn't want to tell my story. People whom I know, survivors, have urged me to say, to, to tell. And I did find out that so many people are telling it. I don't want to take the responsibility that my judgment is the best not to tell. I feel some kind, somehow, maybe I have a responsibility, not for myself, but for other people to tell the story. I don't know for the reason what is going to be. I never wanted to write a book. I never want, But I felt that I am not entitled to have this judgment to say that I am right and everybody is wrong. And this is why I told this story. We're going to change tapes and conclude the interview in a moment. This is tape number nine with Leon Jolson, March 19th, 1998. Do you have dreams about your experiences? I do. I, I have to admit that uh, 
lately this is more not so frequent we years ago but i had the dreams finding myself running and go that uh, they, the Germans are going out to catch people on work and I ran into a building and I uh, ran on the, to the top floor and looked how to go out uh, the, on the, the top and, and I, in the middle I used to wake up wet in, in, uh, in a state what I had to wait a uh, half an hour till I came back to the no, to my normal way of being and thinking. Are there certain events or times of year that cause you to recall the Holocaust? Yes. I had an event uh, in Yom Kippur when I was in Schultz's factory. What stands out always in my mind in, when I think about the Holocaust. It was Yom Kippur in 1943, I think. And in the evening, I thought with a few, with about eight friends, we should sit down and recite the Kol Nidra. I washed myself. <coughs> I changed my cloth. So I thought to prepare something to drink, to eat. The factory of Schulz was Leshno 78. 76 was the living quarters for the Jewish laborers who worked in the factory. Mainly. In 74 was a building where they had a factory what made soft drinks, all kinds of soft drinks. I knew the people who had this factor over there. So I told myself, I will, he was not supposed to sell it. He made it for the Gestapo only, the soft drink. They let him live and stay because the Gestapo wanted to have a, a, a source for sodas and for, so, for soft drinks. So I went in and I asked him to sell me about two cartons of the soft drink and he sold me. As I stay and I am preparing myself to go, something is happening. A German officer with a platoon came, came in and everybody marched. He's marching out. Uh, whoever lived in the building with, who worked for him in the family, to the Umschlagplatz. I go out and start to show him my papers, what I got as an important person to the economy for the Wehrmacht. For the, he said that this is nothing worth. He throws it on the wall and he makes me go to the, to the line to march me out. I went again to him, I was, and he saw that I am, and he told, told me if I don't lie down on the knee, he, he took out the, the, the revolver, he's shooting me. And I saw that he is not uh, uh, joking, but I, as I told you, decided not to go. After knowing what Tablinki is and what uh, what is going to be in this this was in my mind and in this moment I decided not to go. Uh, he had he what was it? He was in charge this day for a transport. And in order to save his skin, he couldn't fill up with the people. In the what he had uh, delivered, he looked for news just to fill up the the train. You understand? So, but he, I got to be known to him because I was the only one who protested, who didn't want to go, who told him that he has no right to take me. I am exempt from anything, from anything. You understand? He was angry. He was yelling. He was howling. But he had to manage to get the hundred people together. In one moment, I saw that he is. On another side, 
I went back into this soda factory. This Jew who had the soda was so afraid, he told me, what do you want from me? I am thanking God that he lets me stay here. What do you want from me? I didn't have, he was right. But I went up. Uh, this was uh, the end of a apartment building after the courtyard. In the, I went into the factory and this was a staircase to go up on the floors. So I went on this staircase. On the third floor, on the, on the fourth floor, I saw a little small window. But this window looked to me goes in in a blind alley and this wasn't opened already for 20 years. But I used all my strength, forced it out and opened it. I opened it and I saw that inside are barrels with all kind of uh, of things well, from what they made the soft drinks the things the uh, the, the uh, chocolate uh, the flavors and all the flavors in it and in the barrels are leftovers what they left when they took it house to make I'm on the third or fourth floor so I decided, and the barrels went up very high. I went out to this window and I closed it back. And I went from one barrel to the other bar barrel till I came to the bottom. And on the bottom, in such a day, the barrel inside with the dust in all this, I, I went in my, myself and I covered myself. And I hear this guy outside yelling and hollering and looking for me. Where's this guy who, whom I told to go? Where is he? And he, I sit inside and he hollers and he looking for me. Couldn't find me. I was lucky that this owner from the uh, soda factory was afraid to, to answer too because he was afraid to look of him, of this SS man came late, he was supposed to come back and to finish the train. He couldn't find me, he went away. And I lie so inside in this bar. It was dark by, it was by seven o'clock, eight. I, I moved out from the bar. And I started my way back as I went down through the, to this window and I went down. The factory that I had there, uh, my, my, an apartment was next, was 76. This was the place where all people lived in 77, 78 was the, was the factory. I knew that the, 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 the entrance to the building is closed six o'clock because curfew star and the German, the, guys who have the job to oversee it stay in on in the entrance they don't let anybody in and let more anybody out. I knew that my wife is staying there in 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 looking for me and I I knew that across the street is the opening to go out and in for the get to the ghetto and you have Gestapo over there with Polish police and I didn't know what to do. Stay till the morning over there, go out, my wife is is getting scared. I uh, I was afraid that she will die from scared. Finally I decided it was dark to go out, ran over to the he yelled to the German guy, was, his name was Neumann, that this is my, open me up the door. And he opened me up the door and I went in. My wife was near the door, white. And you, the, the atmosphere was so, that this is difficult to understand for a new person. People were jealous that the other person has a husband still, that the other person has been died. 
and my wife was staying the needles in his, in, by the other women over there who have been in the entrance that you are not the one who was her husband in, in, the, in, in all those, the, those things. I tell you that sometimes I have been wake, waking uh, the, 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 the feeling when he wanted to shoot me and he didn't let me out and he wanted to take me was so engraved in my brain in my feeling that I am not going that this was a point what I cannot forget and I have it vivid in front of my of my eyes and I walked up in the middle of the night sweating full in water going through the whole thing again. Did you have children with Anya? Yeah. How many children did you have? We had two children. We lost one daughter. Do you have any grandchildren? Yeah. What I are their names? My oldest uh, grandson is about 17. What his is his, his name? Adam. And he is uh, n uh, named after my father. And then I have another grandson. His name is Gideon. Then I have a granddaughter, but her name is Shira. Shira is a song in Hebrew, and there's a part of the Bible, Shir Hashirim, Shir. So they, she, she named her after this part of the Bible. In concluding your interview, is there anything that you'd like to say to your daughter and your grandchildren? I would like to, then to, to tell them that they had a terrible thing have to ha has happened to the Jewish people worldwide, right? We lost a segment of the people what was so important to live, to continue Judaism and Jewish ideals, that they have an obligation to fill in the void what has happened. Is there anything you'd like to say to future generations? To future generations, I would like to say not to forget. I don't feel that this world has saved humanity. Humanity is as bad now as this, as this was in 1944. The important thing is that the Jews should have a homeland where they can live on their own graces. The United States is a wonderful place for Jews, cannot be better, but still they live on the graces of an American government. This is not healthy. Italy has here a big immigration, but Italy exists as a country. Irish people have is a, is a nation and they have a big immigration. Jews as a people who are so mobile, who are so active, who could make out from Israel in a short, in 50 years, a country what has reached the standard of, of living of Great Britain, that the starting salary of a Israeli is $30,000 a year. Always will have um, enemies. Always have, will be exposed to jealousy. A people like this have to remember that they have to preserve that the Israel where they, what is open, what, wherever you can go whenever he wants, in ever danger what is existing, because I remember that people in the ghetto who had connections could go out. It was a way for money, because I told you already, 
the, the corruption of the Germans were so great that I had once a proposition to get a plane for a certain amount of money to go to a neutral country, but where to go? If you went to Switzerland, they caught you on the board, take the two, three thousand people from the border, on the, they sent back in the border. You, this was no, the Britain, they had the mandate, they, did, they didn't let in anybody. So the important thing to have a place on, or where Jews can li live on their own grace is not realized by world jewelry because they live comfortable in the United States and I don't blame them. If I wouldn't have went through this, I myself wouldn't have this feeling. You cannot forget this, that in order to be safe, in order future generation to be safe, Israel has to exist as an independent country. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Leon, would you please introduce the lady sitting next to you? The lady sitting next to me is my lovely wife for, for close to 60 years. And uh, we have spent a uh, life in, uh, in different conditions, and we still came out the way how we are. <laughs> it's the good one. <laughs> Anya, what would you like to say about this whole experience, your husband's telling his story and how you feel about him? You see, I know very well his experience because we, we went through the same thing. There, are, there were just moments when he went by, by himself, for example, to Treblinka. I never went to Auschwitz. I never went there. I didn't want to go. And I, I, I just happy not to see it and uh, I would say that our life here since we are here we were very very happy and very unique extremely wonderful experience we had in this country we met the most fantastic people we never regretted uh, you know like going from hell to heaven that's how I feel and I just can say, bless America. My, my children were born here. Unfortunately, my family is not here to see our happiness and our well-being. And that's what I regret. And I just hope till Hans and Svancik, to be together with my husband and see my grandchildren getting married. And my greatest wish is to be at their wedding. So I have two ways still. I just hope that I will make it. Leon, would you like to say something to your wife? I think that I, I cannot find the words to, uh, to talk to her. This, what she said, is my wish with her. I, I think that this was the most wonderful thing we should be able to bring to the Chupa grandchildren. And uh, the, a, a generation should come out who will live in tranquility and happiness in the future. And I think that they will. They are all uh, uh, able children and they are giving us the the feeling of all the best things what can happen in the future. My wife is very much attached to them and they are attached to her and this is a wonderful thing to come through life after this kind of hell and be in a stage like we are. Thank you very much. This is a picture of my family done in Warsaw when I was a child and not born yet. The first one to the left is my grandmother. The girl in the 
uh, chair is my sister Sarah. The boy over her is my brother Abraham. The young lady near Abraham is my sister Esther. Uh, the lady in the head is my mother Blima. The uh, in between my mother and my father is my brother Benjamin. Near Benjamin is my father Shachnel. Next to my father uh, Shachnel is my sister Zipora. What was your grandmother's name? Leah. This is a letterhead of our business in Warsaw, what was conducted at, under my father's name, Shah Yosselson. The picture shows industrial sewing machines, what are the main point what a sewing plant has to consist of in order to produce garments and underwear. This is the gravestone on the Catholic cemetery in Warsaw, where my brother, my mother, was uh, buried during the Warsaw ghetto closing, where no possibility was to bring to 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 bring a person on the Jewish cemetery. She was buried under a false name, Janina Rudlitska, because this was her false passport as a Catholic. And a cross was, had to be put on the gravestone in order to match all other stones on the cemetery. This is a document what I obtained from the Red Cross in Auschwitz right after the liberation, what helped me to leave Warsaw and go in, my, in the first phase to Hungary and, uh, and Romania. This is a gold coin what has been in my family's fortune, what I put in a heel of a shoe when I had to leave Warsaw in order to have something of what I can always, with a farmer, exchange for food. And I, the, and I, this has been preserved till I came to the United States. Where did you carry this coin? I, in the heel of my shoe. And a shoemaker has put it in, in the heel, and by mistake he put in a nail in the wrong place, mm -hmm. and we have uh, the hole from his mistake on the coin. This is a model of the main Warsaw Synagogue on the Tlomatska Street, what we put up in Tel Aviv, on the grounds of the Tel Aviv University, the, the Museum of Bet Hakvutzot, in memory of my late daughter, Dorothy Jolson. This is a picture of the monument what we commissioned the famous sculpture Nathan Rappaport to put up in Jerusalem on the Har Hazikaron in memory of the Warsaw Ghetto. The whole place was named the Warsaw Ghetto Plaza. In the first to the left is the 
the, the sculpture which shows uh, Danielevich and his the heroes of the uprising. The, um, the picture, the relief on the right is the last march for the, of the Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto. The people who you see in front of you, the first person is one of the functionaries of Yad Vashem, the second is the director of Yad Vashem, Dr. Arad. Next to him, I, Leon Jolson, stay. And next to me, my wife, Anya, stays. Next to my wife is Nathan Rappaport. Next to Rappaport is the chairman and president of Yad Vashem, Dr. Posner. And the, the next to uh, Jack Posner is the executive director of uh, Yad Vashem. Do you remember his name? Yeah. Here you have a ticket for entry to the court where the Eichmann case was uh, proceeding in Jerusalem. I made a special trip to be present and see how the villain Eichmann is put up in the cage from where he has been uh, defending himself. This is a picture of the building, what we built during the ghetto. This, this building was destroyed and was not finished by, by a Jewish family, what was called Volanov. This was a private banking family. And the, during the bombardment, this was even more destroyed. We have built this picture, this the house, this uh, uh, apartment building, together with the Polish underground, the Home Army, in order to put up among the apartments a hiding place in a bunker, what the ha Home Army could keep their military equipment and I and my wife Anya could use the place to hide. When, when we went into the place, there was a hiding door simulated to the wall that nobody could recognize that something is behind the door. And behind the door was actually the ammunition what I kept, the cocktails, uh, the Molotov cocktails what we kept, and this was not discovered in spite that Germans have been looking around and they couldn't find it. This is the gravestone what we substituted after the war for the gravestone with a cross because my mother would be uncomfortable to be buried under a cross, under a cross gravestone. But if, after all, they didn't stay too long because the Poles have destroyed me this uh, gravestone. This is a Sefer Torah, what I brought from Warsaw and donated to the Atlantic Beach a Jewish community center, and we are here on the, my, with my uh, grandson and me, the Torah, and my wife, Anya. What is the name of your grandson? Gideon. Gideon. 